I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to The Hour of the Time. Oh, what a great lady. Anyone, anyone who ever, ever comes to me and tells me that music doesn't penetrate directly to the soul, doesn't have a soul. I mean, that's the only interpretation I could ever make to any statement like that made by anyone. Tonight, folks, we've got to get you back into the stream. And the way I do that is I quit telling you about my research and I quote exactly from the horse's mouth so you'll know that what you're hearing on this program, the hour of the time, is not being made up by me or anyone else. And it's there for anyone to find if you'll just get off your butt and go to the library and start digging and looking and searching and reading and quit listening to what you're told, including what you're told on this show. Remember, my admonition is not to ever believe anything you hear from the mouth of anyone or that you read from the book written by anyone or from Dan Rather in the 6 o'clock news or the President of the United States. Archer Carter, Tom Valentine, Rush Limbaugh, the man who's sitting on half of his brain, are indeed from even your own mother. For folks, the deception in this world right now that's being promulgated in order to bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government is so deep that you better be standing on a stump or you might drown. Alice Bailey, folks, one of the key members of the New Age religion, wrote this. Quote, there is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. These mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the church and the Masonic fraternity. Unquote. And she's absolutely 100% correct. The question of just what the ancient mysteries were, folks, was answered in part by Albert G. Mackey, another 33rd degree Mason. He wrote a two-volume work entitled Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, and he wrote this under the subject of the ancient mysteries. Quote, Each of the pagan gods had, besides the public and open, a secret worship paid to him to which none were admitted but those who had been selected by preparatory ceremonies called initiation. This secret worship was termed the mysteries, unquote. The student of the Masonic order can know that when Mr. Mackey writes, his writings can be relied upon. He is considered to be one of the premier Masonic authors of all time. These are the comments from the biographical information presented on Mr. Mackey in the front of his encyclopedia. Quote, His writings are universally esteemed for their sincerity, honest records, and common sense. He was a leader in research who valued accuracy. Unquote. Carl Cloudy, another mason who writes on the subject of the Lodge, also has words of praise for Mr. Mackey. Quote, he was one of the greatest students and most widely followed authorities the Masonic world has ever known, unquote. And in his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, he praised Mr. Mackey with these words, quote, Albert Gallatin Mackey, one of the greatest students and most widely followed authorities the Masonic world has known. He is the great master of Freemasonry, unquote. So Mr. Mackey, certainly can be believed when he tells his readers that the worship of pagan gods had a secret, non-visible worship besides the public one. The reader can believe him when he identifies the name of this secret worship. He told his readers, quote, this secret worship was termed the mysteries, unquote. Another who has written about the subject of the ancient mysteries was Manly P. Hall, another 33rd degree Mason whom I have quoted extensively before in this series. He has written in his book entitled, What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples. Quote, In the remote past, the gods walked with men, and they chose from among the sons of men the wisest and the truest. 
With these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom, which was the knowledge of good and evil. These illumined ones founded what we know as the ancient mysteries, unquote. Now, in case you weren't listening there, this is a dead giveaway and an admission that the gods that walked with men were known, at least in the Bible, as Satan. For he says here, and I'm going to read this again for you folks, because I know some of you just didn't pick it up. Because I know how the minds of the sheep will operate. And there's a lot of sheeple listening. There's also a lot of people listening who aren't sheeple. And they know that I'm not talking to them. If the word sheeple applied to you makes you angry, then, folks, it is an indication that it fits you like a shoe, like a glove, that you are indeed one of the sheeple. Let me read it again. Quote, With the specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom, which was the knowledge of good and evil. According to the Bible, the knowledge of good and evil was imparted to Adam when Satan enticed Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and she in turn enticed Adam. And what was the fruit of the tree of knowledge? It was the knowledge of good and evil. It was forbidden for man to know that. Now, I'm not making judgment on any of this. I'm just telling you what my research says. Remember, this is not a religious program. And while I, myself, personally, have my own idea of what my own religion is, I am in no means trying to foist it off on anyone else. Let me continue. He wrote, and we're talking about Manly P. Hall, 33rd Degree Freemason, he wrote additional comments about these mysteries in another of the books he has written called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And I would urge you, if you can afford it, to buy that book. It's a very expensive book. I have a copy of it in my library. It cost me $150, and it was worth every single penny of it, I can assure you. Quote, The arcana, defined as being a secret or hidden knowledge of the ancient mysteries, were never revealed to the profane, defined as those not initiated into the inner mysteries, except through the media of symbols. You're going to find, folks, that symbols mean more than you will ever begin to understand unless you wade a deep into the stream of the mystery Babylon, as I have. Quote, Symbolism fulfilled the dual office of concealing the sacred truths from the uninitiated and revealing to those qualified to understand the symbols, unquote. Mr. Hall dedicated the latter book to, quote, the proposition that concealed within the emblematic figures, allegories, and rituals of the ancients is a secret doctrine concerning the inner mysteries of life, which doctrine has been preserved in toto, which means in the whole, among a small band of initiated minds since the very beginning of the world, unquote. He went on to mention that the mysteries, quote, were secret societies, binding their initiates to inviolable secrecy and avenging with death the betrayal of their sacred trust, unquote. And to this day, they take blood oaths. Mr. Hall told the reader that no one is to know the identity of those who have received the secrets. In fact, he wrote, quote, the true adept and initiate shall reveal his identity to no man unless that one is worthy to receive it, unquote. He further explained where some of these initiates lived when he wrote, quote, no reasonable doubt can exist that the initiates of Greece, Egypt, and other ancient countries possessed the correct solutions to those great cultural, intellectual, moral, and social problems which in an unsolved state confront the humanity of the 20th century, unquote. He further amplified that thought when he added this, quote, Neoplatonism, defined by Mr. Hall as a school founded by Plotinus around 240 A.D., concerning itself with the problems of metaphysics, which he calls the study of knowledge, recognizes the existence of a secret and all-important doctrine 
which from the time of the earliest civilizations had been concealed within the rituals, symbols, and allegories of religions and philosophies. Unquote. So, in summary, it is possible, folks, to understand what these ancient mysteries were. And there appears to be at least four truths gleaned from the information provided in the comments made previously. And these truths appear to be. One, the ancient mysteries had two forms of worshipping the same God. Two, the knowledge of the true God was reserved for those who had been entrusted with the secrets, and not for those whom they call the profane. Three, those who understood those secrets were sworn to the strictest secrecy. And four, those who had knowledge of the secrets claimed to possess all of the answers to all of the problems of mankind. Now, there was an additional secret for the secret bearers. They had to be initiated in a private initiation ceremony. Albert Pike, General Albert Pike, a Southern Confederate general during the Civil War, wrote this. Quote, initiation was considered to be a mystical death, and the perfect epoch was then said to be regenerated, newborn, restored to a renovated existence of life, light and purity, unquote. In fact, folks, this, quote, newborn, unquote, experience is similar to the experience the, quote, born again, unquote, Christians go through. The Christians call their experience a second birth just as the Masons do. In fact, Albert Pike calls a similar ceremony a, quote, born-again, unquote, experience, and he wrote this, quote, In the Indian mysteries, the third degree, the initiate is said to be born again, unquote. The ceremony in the ancient mysteries has been described by the Masonic writer Manly P. Hall. Quote, In the ancient system of initiation, the truth seeker must pass through a second birth, and those who attained this exalted state were known thereafter as, quote, the twice born, unquote. This new birth must be personally earned through a complete regeneration of character and conduct, unquote. This new birth ceremony involves a symbolic death, according to the Mason Kenneth McKenzie, and he wrote this, quote, in the ancient mysteries, the aspirant could not participate in the highest secrets until he had been placed in the coffin. In this, he was symbolically said to die, and his resurrection was to the life. Unquote. Now remember, I told you about the initiation that George Bush underwent in the crypt, also known as the tomb, the skull and bones, the Brotherhood of Death at Yale University. This is what they're talking about. During a press conference, a reporter asked George Bush if he was a Christian. And he replied thusly, quote, If you're asking if I have been born again, the answer is yes. Unquote. And indeed, he has. Modern day Masons participate in an almost similar ceremony to the one described by these Masonic writers. In the third degree, called the Master Mason degree, inside the Blue Lodge, the candidate is actually knocked off of his feet by several of the Masons in attendance. He is wrapped up in a blanket and moved to the western end of the temple. There, after further ceremony, he is raised up by a grip called the Master's Grip, or the Grip of the Lion's Paw. Those who learned the mysteries also learned that they had a secret project, one that was described by Albert Pike in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. Mr. Pike wrote this, quote, Behold our object, the end, the result of the great speculations of antiquity, the ultimate annihilation of evil and restoration of man to his first estate by a Redeemer, a Messiah, a Christos, the incarnate word, reason, or power of deity, unquote. I urge you all, if you can find a copy of Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, to purchase it, take it home, and read it. 
Mr. Hall told his readers that those who had been initiated into the mysteries were the secret power behind the governments of the past. He wrote this about these ancient initiates in his book entitled What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples. Quote, they are the invisible powers behind the thrones of earth, and men are but marionettes, dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. We see the dancer, but the master mind that does the work remains concealed by the cloak of silence, unquote. Remember, I told you folks that if you don't open your mind, and if you don't quit believing dogma, if you don't quit believing what people tell you, if you don't stop believing what Dan Rather tells you on the 6 o'clock news, or your local minister down at your church, or your mother, or the President of the United States, and if you don't start digging to find the truth yourself, you, you, the sheeple, are the marionette, dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. And until you change that pattern of your life, you will always be the puppet on the end of someone else's string. And I know that that's not what you want to be. Is it? Well, if it's not, change your life now. Stop believing what you are told, including what you hear on this show, unless it checks out in your own research, your own experience, your own digging each of us must find our own truth. And if our we are really looking and digging, we're ultimately going to come to something near the same truth for all of us. And I can tell you now that most of us have been living in fantasy land for all of our lives. We don't even know anything near what the truth of any matter is. We must begin an honest search. Starting from the beginning, wiping the slate clean, cleansing our mind, and looking at the world, beginning again, as though through the eyes of a newborn child. And you will find that most of what you've ever been taught in your entire life is a lie. Is a lie. Other writers, folks, have confirmed the thoughts of Mr. Hall. A Masonic scholar named George Steinmetz also acknowledged that these mysteries exist and that some of the members inside the Masonic lodges are custodians of the secrets. He has written this in his book entitled Freemasonry, Its Hidden Meaning. Quote, Ancient secret doctrine which is concealed in Masonic allegory and symbolism it was but to preserve these truths for future generations that masonry was perpetuated, unquote. And if that is true, why is it a secret? Why not tell us all what this secret doctrine is? For modern man is not like ancient man when he didn't know how to read or reason or understand. Modern man has the capability to understand anything that is put before him and accept it if it is the truth and reject it if it is a lie. So why the secrecy? The secrecy is because, folks, the real secret of Mystery Babylon is how to control everyone else. And if they reveal these secrets, they won't have the control, for it will be in the hands of everyone. That is the greatest secret of the secret societies. Another writing of Manly P. Hall, was this, quote, Much of the ritualism of Freemasonry is based upon the trials to which candidates were subjected by the ancient hierophants. Hierophant is defined as the high priest of the mysteries. Before the keys of wisdom were enthroned to them, unquote. The ancient mysteries had a beginning. According to Mr. Mackey, he wrote about where they started. Quote, the first of which are those of Isis and Osiris in Egypt. The most important of these mysteries were the Osiric in Egypt, unquote. Another writer, Edmund Ronane, an ex-Mason, confirmed that the Masons were involved in the worship of Osiris when he wrote this in his book entitled The Master's Carpet. Quote, 
masonry's ceremonies, symbol, and the celebrated legend of Hiram in the Master Mason's degree were directly borrowed from the ancient mysteries of the secret worship of Baal, Osiris, or Tammuz. Unquote. This is a direct admission that Freemasonry stems directly out of Mystery Babylon, the ancient mystery religion, the worship of Baal, the golden calf, representative of the house during which that 2,000-year period, the sun resided. The sun, the symbol of the light, Lucifer, the intellect, the gift, primordial knowing. Albert Pike then detailed where the mysteries went after their beginnings in Egypt. He wrote this in Morals and Dogma. Quote, From Egypt, the mysteries went to Phoenicia and were celebrated at Tyre. Osiris changed his name and became Adonai, or Dionysus, still the representative of the sun. In Greece and Sicily, Osiris took the name of Bacchus. So the ancient mysteries conceal an important mystery kept secret from the average person. The mystics claim that this mystery has been concealed from the world for centuries. Even though they had taken the mystery to other continents, those who believed in this religion were yet to take it to America. That was yet to come, and we will get to that, I promise you. And it will, I also promise you, amaze you. Lafayette, who was a very famous and noted pirate and a member of Freemasonry and the Knights Templar, said this, quote, an invisible hand is guiding the populace, unquote. Arthur Edward Waite, a prolific writer on secret societies, has written this, quote, beneath the broad tide of human history, there flow the stealthy undercurrents of the secret societies, which frequently determine in the depths the changes that take place upon the surface, unquote. Another who wrote about the power just underneath the surface was President Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States of America, who made this startling statement. He made the statement, yet it was ignored, but it should never go ignored from this point forward. Quote, there is a power so organized, so subtle, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it, unquote. So these two writers have warned America that secret societies had been arranging the major events of the past, and President Wilson warned those who were quick to condemn these organizations that they had better be cautious. Albert Pike also connected the secret societies with a secret belief in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. He wrote that all secret orders and associations, quote, and remember, he says, all, all secret orders and associations, quote, had two doctrines, one concealed and reserved for the masters, the other public, unquote. Now, one such secret society with two doctrines was the Illuminati, and Professor Weishaupt, its founder, boasted of his organization's secrecy. He realized that this secrecy would enable them to decide the fate of nations, and because their deliberations were secret, no outsider could interfere. He wrote this, quote, The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. Unquote. Wyckoff later wrote about that secrecy in a letter to a fellow member of the Illuminati. Quote, Nothing can bring this about but hidden societies. Hidden schools of wisdom are the means which will one day free men from their bonds. Princes and nations shall vanish from the earth, unquote. Folks, don't go away. We've got to stop for a break. I'll be right back after this very short pause. 
Don't forget, folks, this Monday night, March 15th, from 8 p.m. to 11, I'll be at the Lafayette Hotel at 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego, California. That's this coming Monday night, Monday, March 15th, at 8 p.m. to 11. I'll be at the Lafayette Hotel at 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego, California. I'll be giving a three-hour presentation entitled, The Sacrificed King. This is on the Kennedy assassination. I'm going to have footage there that you've never seen before. I'm going to show you the direct, and I mean direct, absolute occult connection to the Kennedy assassination. But I'll tell you what group killed our president, murdered our president, if you will. I'm going to show you the footage of what Dealey Plaza really is so that you'll see that this is not just an innocent park in the city of Dallas. I'm going to show you where Dallas really is and what the occult significance of its location means. And when you leave there, folks, you're going to understand more about the workings of the world and who assassinated our president and why than you ever have before. You're also going to see that uh, Oliver Stone knew all of this and chose to deceive the American people because he is one of those who are bringing about the New World Order. And his movie, JFK, was designed to convince all of us that our government doesn't work, that constitutional government can't work, that it's turned against us, and it's not true, folks. Our constitutionally instituted and established government had absolutely nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination. As all of those who show up on Monday night, March 15th, 8 p.m., will find out. Now, if you're not a CAGI member, you can purchase your tickets in advance. And uh, one of the places is the Controversial Bookstore in San Diego. It's also a place where you can get some of the books that are banned or hard to get or are suppressed that you need in your personal library in order to understand all of what you're learning on this show and and a lot of what you're never going to hear on this show, simply because there isn't enough time. And all of you should be engaged in your own private research looking for the truth. Now, if you'd like to call and find out about this conference, which actually starts on Friday and goes through the whole weekend, there's a lot of Looney Tune people there spouting a lot of BS and disinformation and crap and just out and out lies. And there are some people there who are valiantly, as I am, trying to get the truth out and, and uh, inform people. But here's the number in case you'd like to call, in case there are some of the speakers that you'd like to go and listen to during that weekend. The number is 619-492-8588. That's 619-492-8588. Well, folks, you've heard all through this series of broadcasts about a group of men, supposedly with the only truly mature minds in this world, who are going to set up a utopia on Earth, a heaven on Earth, if you will, and that they are the ones who are going to rule through a benevolent despotism. And they call this utopia, the great society, the new world order, the utopian philosophy, all of these things. Now, Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was a member of this secret society. He was, in fact, a 33rd degree Freemason. And his great society that he envisioned was exactly what we're talking about here. And you can see that Johnson, a great socialist, a Marxist, secretly, set us on the road to socialism by setting up this great welfare state, which he called the Great Society. It's one and the same, folks. It's the same. George Bush's New World Order is the same. The New World Order that our forefathers envisioned was the same. The Great Society talked about during the Peasants' Revolt in England was the same. The same that is coming unless we wake up to stop it. And you can see by the welfare state how well it really works. It doesn't work at all. It never will work. It can't work. These people are Looney Tunes. If you believe the exoteric version of what they intend to bring about, you see they have no intention of bringing about a utopia, a heaven on earth, a great society, not at all. That's to lure the unwary, the foolish, the great mass of followers to make up the lower degrees of this secret society so that they will support 
the completion of the great work, the plan. They really intend this to be something along the lines of what Hitler attempted to establish. They talk about it in terms of a great cleansing where certain religions, certain people, certain races will literally be eliminated from this earth. And they are convicted through their own words. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are hearing tonight, you've heard another broadcast. For when I feel that you are getting to the point where <coughs> you're not understanding what's happening, I go back, as I'm doing tonight, and quote these people directly from their own mouths. I'm going to do that again tomorrow night, folks, so be ready. Let me continue. The secret societies were created to bring the world to the new society known as the New World Order. The members of these organizations obviously feel that their goals are so noble that they may perform whatever tasks are required to bring them to that goal and that goal to fruition. This means, folks, that murder, plunder, and lying all become acceptable as long as these methods assist its members in obtaining their goal. But the Freemasons, or Freemasons, as the true term began, want the world to know that they are not one of the societies involved in changing the world's civilization, and they're quick to rush to their own defense. However, when you go back and read their own history and their own words, you can see that they have literally no defense, for they are convicted by the words of their leaders, by the very words of their leaders and folks by their deeds. For it was General Albert Pike who created, through the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. It was the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry that created the branch known as B'nai B'rith, which then created the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which is nothing but an organization of criminals who have murdered, who have bombed, who have lied, and just recently, one of their revealed crimes was spying, putting spies within the police organizations of the United States of America and spiriting out files and records. And all of the Jews in the United States support this criminal organization to their great shame. And those of you who feel that the Jews are responsible for all of this, you are wrong. Most Jews don't know any more about this than you did. And they are being used just as you are being used, just as I have been used in my life. In all time, truth has been hidden under symbols, wrote Albert Pike. And he also wrote this, Symbols are nevertheless ingenious veils that cover the truth. Now, Albert Pike was the sovereign grand commander of the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The Scottish Rite now controls world Freemasonry. There certainly seems, folks, to be a power in knowing something that you can't tell your family, friends, children, or business acquaintances. And Adam Weishaupt said it best with this selection from his writings. Quote, Of all the means I know to lead men, the most effectual is a concealed mystery. Unquote. And that is true, I've found in my research, that the vast fools, the followers, flock to the mysteries and the promise of learning some secret during their climb up the ladder of degrees of initiation. The truth is that only a very few ever learn anything, and what they learn is how to control the rest. The power of hidden symbols was alluded to by another writer, this time Foster Bailey in his book entitled The Spirit of Freemasonry. Quote, a symbol veils or hides a secret, and is that which veils certain mysterious forces. These energies, when released, can have a potent effect. Unquote. And indeed, they can, as we are all feeling now the peach of the power. There are many who can attest to that simple truth. Organizations with concealed or secret initiation ceremonies abound in America and indeed around the world. College fraternities and sororities teach the college student to accept secret initiation ceremonies and hidden knowledge at a young age. The Masons, intended for adult males, have similar organizations for their young sons and daughters and other secret organizations for their wives. 
and all of these organizations tend to prepare their male members for further service in the master secret organization, the Masons. However, the Masons are quick to point out that they conceal their truths from the general public. Manly P. Hall, for instance, wrote this, quote, It is for the adepts, an adept is defined by the dictionary as one who is an expert, but there is an esoteric definition that shall be discussed later. Quote, it is for the adepts, one to understand the meaning of the symbols, unquote. He further instructed his readers that understanding the symbols could make one wise, quote, and understanding of these symbols is the beginning of wisdom, unquote. Max Toth, a writer about the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt, also wrote about the purpose of symbols, and he said, quote, The knowledge of the ancient mysteries was never revealed to the layman except through the media of symbols. Symbolism fulfilled both the need to conceal sacred truths from the uninitiated and to offer a language for those qualified to understand it. And whatever these secrets are, folks, one writer on the subject feels it is time to make them public. Alice Bailey, one of the key writers supporting the New Age movement, wrote this, quote, The hour for the ancient mysteries has arrived. These ancient mysteries were hidden in numbers, in ritual, in words, and in symbology. These veil the secret, unquote. Another writer who writes on the order, Carl H. Cloudy, told anyone who read the Masonic literature that he had best understand the language or they would miss the true meaning of the words. He wrote, quote, He who hears but the words of Freemasonry misses their meaning entirely. Unquote. Rex Hutchins, a 32nd degree Mason who has written a book for the Masons, one so important that it was used to replace one written by Henry Clausen, a former sovereign commander, also informed his readers that his writings also concealed a secret. Quote, the word reveal means to re-veil, that is, to give one explanation and yet continue to maintain the mystery of the symbol by not explaining it in a full and complete manner, unquote. So the language code must be broken if one is to learn the truth about the Masonic Order. The reason that this is so is because the Masons have admitted that they have concealed the true meaning of some of their language. However, it is possible, folks, to know the true meanings of at least some of the hidden language. And the listener can be certain that the discovered interpretations are correct because the Masons themselves have revealed the hidden meanings of some of their symbols and some of their own literature. The secret societies, folks, that have concealed their purposes and hidden meanings, concealed writings and private initiation ceremonies, are admittedly very powerful. One who recognized that power was Benjamin Disraeli, the Prime Minister of England in the late 1880s, who said this in the House of Commons on July 14th in 1856. Quote, There is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house. I mean the secret societies. It is useless to deny because it is impossible to conceal that a great part of Europe, the whole of Italy and France and a great portion of Germany, to say nothing of other countries, is covered with a network of these secret societies. What are their objects? They do not want constitutional government. They want to change the tenure of the land, to drive out the present owners of the soil, and to put an end to ecclesiastical establishments, meaning religion, unquote. The Masons know about concealing secrets from the rest of the world. Carl Cloudy, a Masonic writer, told his readers that secrets are inside secrets, which are inside other secrets, and he wrote this, quote, Cut through the outer shell and find a meaning. Cut through that meaning and find another. Under it, if you dig deep enough, you may find a third, a fourth. Who shall say how many teachings? Unquote. And even the communists used concealment, for the communists were created by the mysteries. The cell system of the Communist Party was created by the mystery schools, which have used the same system for millennia. Nikolai Lenin, the Marxist communist who communized the Russian nation in the years following the Russian Revolution of 1917, wrote this, quote, We have to use any ruse, dodge, trick, cunning, unlawful method, concealment, and veiling of the truth, unquote. Many of the signs for identifying a communist 
are a member of the Communist Party, are exactly the same as those symbols and signs used by Freemasons to identify each other. The use of secrecy to conceal thoughts from certain of the members of an organization or from the public is the device of those who have something to hide. That something is so horrible, so terrible, that knowledge of that secret must be kept from those who would have the most to lose by knowledge of that secret. In the case of the secret societies, it is a belief in Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. In the case of communism, it is the truth that the people living in a communist nation know that the system does not work. But those in a non-communist nation targeted for a communist government are not to learn that simple truth. They are to be told that the system is the culmination of man's upward search for a perfect society, a great society, if you will, a utopia on earth. And they must be deluded into believing that there is no cost in the change from their current form of government to the communist form. One of the things that I find so incredible is that they trap the intellectuals so easily. The intellectuals, the ones who are supposedly so good at using their brain, cannot even use their brain so much as to look into history to see that the first people that the communists, the international socialists, destroy, kill, sentence to the labor camps, the gulag, if you will, are always the intellectuals. The history has recorded the brutality of the communists and the fact that millions of people have had to die as the communists installed that form of government. The evidence to support that condition will be discussed later in some other program. Now, secrecy is certainly not a part of the Christian religion today, although the Christian religion began in secret and was, in fact, a secret society. It is possible to know that nothing that Jesus said has been hidden from the Christians of today. He told the high priest in John, chapter 18, verse 20, quote, And in secret have I said nothing, unquote. The intentional concealing of an organization's beliefs and purposes by the use of hidden language and concealed symbols is reserved primarily to the secret societies and the nationwide Masonic lodges, or indeed a secret society. And in the beginning, the Christians had their secret symbols also. One of the most prominent was the symbol of the fish. The secret is simply the fact that certain of their members worship Lucifer, and that they keep that secret from the overwhelming majority of their own members, and certainly the public is never to know this fact, if they can help it. And the evidence to support that conclusion is ample, but only to one who cares enough to look for it. The problem with most people is they don't care enough to look for anything except Wheel of Fortune on the television set. So the student of history has to discover the hidden meanings behind the symbols and the Masonic literature and in the secret initiation ceremonies to understand the Masonic Order. One of the first symbols that needs to be examined is the symbol of the serpent, also called a snake or dragon. Manny P. Hall wrote that the use of this symbol is as old as early man when he wrote this in his book entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Quote, Among nearly all these ancient peoples, the serpent was accepted as a symbol of wisdom, unquote, for it is from the serpent that man received the gift of intellect. Here Mr. Hall states that the serpent was a symbol of wisdom. It will be remembered that Lord Maitreya, the future New Age leader, also claimed to possess wisdom. Mr. Hall continued, quote, Serpent worship in some form has permeated nearly all parts of the earth. The serpent is the symbol and prototype of the universal Savior who redeems the world by giving creation the knowledge of itself and the realization of good and evil, unquote, an admission that the serpent at least from the point of view of the Christian Bible, is Satan. And then Mr. Hall links the serpent with the ancient mysteries previously discussed. He continues with the comment that the serpent was worshipped by the priests of that religion. Quote, the priests of the mysteries were symbolized as a serpent, sometimes called Hydra, unquote. And then he pointed out that the ancient mysteries have been passed on to various other cultures and that they have been brought forward to the present day. Folks, we'll continue this tomorrow night. If you can, reach into your pockets, make out a check or money order to WWCR, and send it to the address which you'll hear at the end of this broadcast. Also, write to us and ask for a packet of information. Our call stand, and he'll give it into the mail immediately. 
Until tomorrow night, good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. Well, it's hard to believe, folks, but this is the 16th hour of broadcasting in our series on Mystery Babylon. You're listening to the Hour of the Time, and I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have just listened to is a warning. Is a warning. For there is a war being conducted right at this moment, a war against the American people. It is now a shooting war, and the second battle is being fought. The first was fought in the state of Idaho against the family of Randy Weaver. The second battle is being fought by a brave group of men and women and children in a church known as Branch Davidian in Waco, Texas. They are fighting for their creator endowed rights. They have committed no crimes. They know what the sound of battle is. They know what it's like to see their friends or relatives die in their arms or at their feet. They know what it's like to have wounded and be refused medicine and medical treatment. Oh, yes. We are at war. Make no mistake about it. And if you don't believe that, you keep your eyes and ears open the next weeks, months, and years. You will see it escalate across this country like a wild forest fire out of control. And unless the sheeple wake up and listen and learn and act, I predict that there will be civil war in the United States of America because there are many of us who will not ever give up our creator-endowed rights, our right to keep and bear arms, the Constitution of the United States, and the Bill of Rights without one hell of a fight. And what you heard at the beginning of this program, folks, for those of you who have never experienced war, was the real sounds of war. What you heard were real bullets being fired, real bombs being dropped, real machine guns killing real people. And taps at the end was a real bugle blowing real taps over real graves of real fallen men who were buried in Arlington National Cemetery. You see, many people have already died protecting what many of you are giving up. I, for one, will not. When they come for me, there will be another battle. I will not give up. But I don't care who wins or loses. Because at the end of my battle, it will be just the beginning of yours. Do you understand what I'm telling you? You see, my whole purpose is to wake enough people so that no battles ever have to be fought, but we're already behind because two have already been fought, and more, I guarantee you, are on the way. Guaranteed, folks. Guaranteed. Because the more we allow them to get away with, the more they will attempt. I don't want a civil war in this country. I want to stop it before it even has a chance to start. And the only way to do that is wake up America. You see, if 200 million people stand up 
with their right under the second article and amendment to the Constitution, holding a weapon in their hand, and say, enough, we will not put up with this anymore, stop it now, get out of our government, get out of our cities, get out of our military and stay out. That will be the end of it, and no shot will ever have to be fired. I guarantee that. But what do you think the odds are of that happening? Well, it's time, folks, to talk about our sponsor, Swiss American Trading Corporation. Now, if you've followed my broadcast for any length of time, you know that I've been bringing you this show, The Hour of the Time, mostly without sponsorship. In part, I've been very leery of allowing just any corporation or any business to buy time on my show, and my requirements are very strict. I'm proud, folks, very proud to announce a new alliance. Swiss America Trading Corporation and myself are committed to preparing my listening audience for the upcoming economic trauma. Many of you have asked me, what can I do to save my assets? What can I do to protect myself against the economic collapse that's coming? Well, folks, for over 11 years, Swiss America has been supplying over 10,000 clients with hard assets and constant information on how best to protect those assets. And for a limited time, interested listeners can receive a complimentary newsletter if you mention my name, William Cooper, the hour of the time, and ask for the information on protecting your future. It's called protecting your future. So call, folks. Call this number. Write it down right now. You should always have a pen and paper with you when you listen to this broadcast. You know that. Write this down. 1-800-289-2673. That's 1-800-289-2646. Let me say it one more time for you. 1-800-289-2646. Invest the time it takes, folks, to read one of the most important publications of our times. Call 1-800-289-2646. Swiss American Trading Corporation they have all of the investments that we have recommended on previous broadcasts, and they have many more. Some we don't recommend, but it's up to you to choose. They're a reputable company. We've thoroughly checked them out. We have talked to their clients, their customers. We've checked their background. We've checked with law enforcement agencies. And I'm telling you right now, these people will treat you right. If they don't, you call me and let me know immediately. Now, this is the 16th hour of our series on Mystery Babylon. Many of you have already made the necessary connections. You know what's happening, and you know who's bringing it about, and you know why. Some of you still do not. So we will continue. Manny P. Hall wrote this. Quote, The Serpent Kings... And notice that Mr. Hall capitalized the two words as one would do for a deity or for royalty when he wrote this, reigned over the earth. The serpent kings reigned over the earth. It was these serpent kings who founded the mystery schools which later appeared as the Egyptian and Brahmin mysteries. The serpent was their symbol. They were the true sons of light. And from them have descended a long line of adepts and initiates duly tried and proven according to the law, unquote. And the proper term is not Freemason, it's Freemason. It comes from the French, from the Knights Templar, and it literally means the sons of light. Another writer, Wilfred Gregson, informed his readers why Mr. Hall capitalized the two words serpent kings when he wrote, Quote, one symbol of great prominence throughout all ancient civilizations is the snake, or serpent, where it has symbolized divine wisdom, unquote. So Mr. Hall had reason to capitalize the words because he had discovered that the serpent represented divinity. 
Notice also, folks, that Mr. Gregson, even though he chose not to capitalize the word serpent, confirmed that Mr. Hall's use of the capital letter was correct when he stated that there was a connection between divine wisdom and the serpent. Mr. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason, made the same connection in these comments. Quote, the serpent is true to the principles of wisdom, for it tempts man to the knowledge of himself. Unquote. A serpent is often used by the ancients to symbolize wisdom. The symbol of the serpent has another concealed truth, according to Kenneth Mackenzie, for he identified that truth in this quote when he described a brazen serpent. Quote, it was a type of mediator and a promise of redemption. Unquote. The word brazen, folks, is defined as bold or impudent. And impudent is defined as shamelessly bold or disrespectful. Now you will remember that Lucifer was an anointed cherub in heaven who fell because he sought godly power. The story is covered in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14 of the Old Testament. Look it up. It says this, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High, unquote. Therefore, it can be safely said that Lucifer would be considered to be shamelessly bold, and, of course, disrespectful. It appears that the brazen serpent could be Lucifer. Another author, John Anthony West, wrote a book entitled Serpent in the Sky, in which he also connected the serpent with wisdom, and he wrote this, quote, The serpent represents intellect, the faculty by which man discriminates. There is a higher and a lower intellect. Thus, symbolically, there is a serpent that crawls, and the higher intellect, that which allows man to know God, the heavenly serpent, the serpent in the sky, unquote. The somewhat veiled worship of this serpent in the sky, inside the Masonic lodges, was alluded to by another Masonic writer, Kenneth McKenzie, for in his book entitled The Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, he wrote this, quote, Among the charges preferred against the Order of Knights Templar for which Jacques de Molay suffered martyrdom was that of worshipping an idol or image called Baphomet. It has been suggested that Baphomet is none other than the Ancient of Days, our Creator. More cannot be said here without improperly revealing what we, meaning the Masons, are bound to heal, conceal, and never reveal, unquote. So according to this Mason, the snake or serpent is somehow a symbol of the subject of the Masonic worship, and apparently this fact is the secret that the Masons cannot reveal to the rest of the world. A Christian minister Reverend Alexander Hislop wrote a book that included some discussion on the subject of serpent worship. And in that book, entitled Two Babylons, he explained that serpent worship was not something that is recent in time. It was an ancient practice. Quote, Along with the sun, this symbol will be discussed later as the great fire god, and in due time identified with him, was the serpent worshipped. In the mythology of the primitive world, the serpent is universally the symbol of the sun. As the sun was the great enlightener of the physical world, so the serpent was held to have been the great enlightener of the spiritual by giving mankind the knowledge of good and evil, unquote, and according to the Bible, you know who gave man the knowledge of good and evil? Satan. Lucifer. He then discussed a coin minted in Tyre, the center of the ancient Phoenician culture. This coin was also the subject of an article in the September 1986 issue of the Good News magazine. It depicted a serpent entwined around a tree stump. 
To the left of the stump stood an empty cornucopia, and to the right a flourishing palm tree. The snake on the coin is the symbol of the powerful god whom the Romans called Esculapius. The name means the man instructing snake, or the snake that instructs man, and the article then reported, quote, in mythology, Esculapius was believed to be the child of the sun, and thus the enlightener of mankind. As the legend goes, Esculapius was ultimately struck down by a thunderbolt thrown by an angry Zeus, king of the gods, and cast into the underworld, unquote. The tree stump, folks, represented the fallen god and his ruined kingdom. In the mythologies of many ancient civilizations, the image of a fallen tree was used to symbolize the cutting off of a great god or hero, someone cut off in the midst of their power. You see, the snake on the coin was shown twisting itself around the dead stump, exerting its power in an attempt to restore his fallen kingdom. The cornucopia is an ancient symbol of plenty, but it was empty on the coin. This has been interpreted as meaning that the abundance had been cut off because the great God has been cut off. However, folks, the implication is that the horn of plenty will return when the fallen God is restored to his rightful position. The palm tree shown on the coin is a well-known symbol of victory. So it appears that the coin was minted to depict the anticipated return of the fallen snake god to the world. And the Bible talks about a fallen serpent in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9. However, in this case, folks, the snake is connected to another symbol of the serpent, a great dragon. Quote, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, unquote. Is the serpent worshipped in the ancient mysteries and a symbol in the Masonic ceremonies, a symbol of Satan, the devil? As has already been discussed, there is indeed evidence, folks, that this is the case. And once you have confronted the evidence and studied as much as I have studied, you will know that they are one and the same. Another symbol that needs to be analyzed is the star. On the page opposite page 124 in Mackey's Encyclopedia is a drawing illustrating the symbols of Freemasonry. Included in the 20 or so Masonic symbols is a drawing of a shooting star. Now, it can be fairly claimed that a blazing or shooting star would be one that was on the move inside the universe. One of the directions it could move would be, of course, towards the Earth. If it was moving towards the Earth, it could be called a falling star. But we know that most falling stars are actually meteors and not stars at all. Lucifer, however, is a fallen angel, according to Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet, who wrote this in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Unquote. Now, folks, notice that Isaiah also said that Lucifer fell from heaven, and other parts of the Bible report that he fell to the earth. So it is conceivable that the symbol of the falling or blazing star could be a symbol of Lucifer. A variety of authors have used their writings to discuss the star as a symbol. Professor Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, was one who explained what he considered the star to be a symbol of. <laughs> Listen closely. Quote, The flaming star is the torch of reason, unquote. Mr. Mackey wrote that the star, quote, was a symbol of God, unquote. He then connected the blazing star to another symbol when he wrote, quote, the blazing star refers us to the sun, unquote. And then he connected it with the secret initiation ceremonies inside the Masonic Lodge. Quote, in the fourth degree of the same rite, the Scottish rite of Freemasonry, the blazing star is again said to be a symbol of the light of divine providence pointing out the way of truth, unquote. And Mr. Hutchins, 
the Masonic writer, who has authored the recent book on Masonry, further interpreted the symbol of the star thusly. Quote, the star as a type of the myriad suns that light other countless systems of worlds is an emblem of that Masonic light in search of which every Mason travels, the correct knowledge of the deity and of his laws that control the universe, unquote. Now, closely allied with the symbol of the star is the symbol of the sun. Albert Pike identified it with the worship of the past, in this collection of quotes from his writings, and pay close attention. Quote, the worship of the sun became the basis of all the religions of antiquity, unquote. Quote, thousands of years ago, men worshipped the sun. Originally, they looked beyond the orb to the invisible God. They personified him as Brahma, Amun, Osiris, Baal, Adonis, Malkarth, Mithras, and Apollo, Krishna is the Hindu sun god, unquote. Quote, the Gauls worshipped the sun under the name of Belen, or Belenis, unquote. Quote, the sun is the ancient symbol of the life-giving and generative power of the deity. The sun was his manifestation and visible image, unquote. Quote, the sun is the hieroglyphical sign of truth because it is the source of light, unquote. So Mr. Pike identified the sun as a symbol of a deity that should be worshipped. He chose to capitalize the first letter in the word, the S, as one would in recognizing the name of a deity. And if you've been listening to this series, you already know that, of course, it was. Albert Mackey repeated Mr. Pike's contentions with comments like these about sun worship. Quote, It was the oldest and by far the most prevalent of all the ancient religions. Eusebius says that the Phoenicians and the Egyptians were the first who ascribed divinity to the sun. Hardly any of the symbols of masonry are more important in their signification, are more extensive in their application, than the sun as the source of material light. It minds the mason of that intellectual light of which he is in constant search. The sun is then presented to us in masonry, first as a symbol of light, but then more emphatically as a symbol of sovereign authority. Unquote. So, folks, the sun was a symbol of something that only the believers in the religion known as the ancient mysteries understood. These believers, called adepts, certainly knew that the people would not accept their mystery religion, so they had to conceal it from them. Don't go away, folks. We've got to take a short break. I'll be right back after this pause. So the task became one of creating a religion around a belief that they knew the people would accept because it would make some sense, at least as far as the adepts would explain it. But their basic purpose was to create a popular religion as a cover for their secret worship. The secret religion would be built around a belief in the sun. The sun would be a perfect thing to build a religion around because of its basic nature. It is very visible and has a very important role in man's life. It rises in the morning. It appears to be born and then sets during the evening. It appears to die, and then appears to be born again the next morning. It also appears to wander in the sky, setting further north or south each night, and then returns back to any given position twice each year. So the sun appears to have a major birth or death twice each day and twice each year. It would, of course, be very easy for the adepts to explain to the people that only something bigger than mankind, a god, had the ability to die and come back to life. So the adepts would teach the people that they had to pray to the god, or it would choose not to return. They encouraged a worship of the sun so that it would return to mankind again either once a day or once every six months. Albert Pike confirmed this view with this explanation of why early man worshipped the sun. 
Quote, to them, meaning early men, the journeyings of the sun were voluntary and not mechanical. Unquote. So early man considered the sun to be something that moved voluntarily. In other words, the sun did not have to return each morning. Man must have quickly determined that since the sun did not have to return, man should start asking it to return. For man certainly depended upon the sun for his life. Man certainly must have figured out just how important the sun was to his life and well-being. And he certainly must have determined that if the sun chose not to return, all of mankind would certainly perish. So it was an easy jump from a belief that the necessary sun was an entity that chose to move across the daytime sky to a belief that it would return only if man prayed to it to return. Well, it's time once again, folks, to acquaint you with Swiss America Trading Corporation, our new sponsor. You've never heard me advertise on my show for any outside unknown firm. And in fact, we've only really had two sponsors on this show ever, simply because my requirements are strict. Complete background check, references, testimony from clients. I mean, we really put these people through their paces. And folks, I'm not about to change anything now. This company's been in business for over 11 years. They deliver to your door non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. You've all been asking me how to save your assets, how to protect yourself from the coming economic collapse. Well, call Swiss American Trading Corporation right now. Do it now, folks. Because I'm telling you right now, these people have all of the investments that you heard me recommend on this show. They also have a lot of other investments, some of which I don't know anything about, some of which we don't recommend. But they have everything for you to make an intelligent choice. They're legitimate. We check them out from top to bottom, including with law enforcement agencies. And I'm telling you right now, if you really want to take your money or your assets and put them in a position to survive what's coming, then you need to call Swiss American Trading Corporation right now. You see, I would not take them on as a sponsor if I did not believe in this company. If I would not recommend them to you without any hesitation whatsoever if I would not use their services myself. You see, they fit all of the qualifications. They also write a newsletter that openly, openly deals with the imminent economic collapse. They also consider privacy and discretion an integral part of the relationship with their clients, and you need that. This is Swiss America Trading Corporation. If you call 1-800-289-2646, that's 1-800-289-2646, I'm going to say it one more time, 1-800-289-2646 today, and state that you listen to me, William Cooper, on the hour of the time, they will send you their complimentary newsletter entitled, Protecting Your Future. Now remember, it's entitled Protecting Your Future. Make sure you ask for it. The only obligation you have is to commit a quality hour, folks, into reading and considering the information in this newsletter. It doesn't cost you a thing. And you're not obligated ever for that newsletter. So call 1-800-289-2646 right now. Call 1-800-289-2646. Four six right now, this minute. One eight hundred two eight nine two six four six and tell them William Cooper sent you. But folks, there's something even more interesting to be considered that Pike didn't explain with that comment. Obviously, to make the new religion work, 
the believers would have to be able to predict the movements of the sun. It wouldn't be too long before some of the common people would start noticing that the sun was neither an actual being nor a god to be worshipped, but something that moved according to precise laws. Now, if the common people figured that out, they would not need the adepts who had computed the sun's periodic cycles. So, to keep their power intact, they would teach the people that if they did not accommodate their wishes, they would make certain that the sun did not return. They could even predict, as their measurements became more sophisticated, the exact time and date when the moon would go between the sun and the earth, causing the sun to disappear. They could then fool the people into believing that they were the cause of the disappearance. They could then, of course, explain to the people that if they did not continue to pay them sort of tribute, they would not intercede in their behalf, and the sun would not reappear. To keep the minds of the common people, the sheeple, away from figuring out that the whole religion was a scam, the adepts would conduct beautiful and ornate ceremonies around the worship of the sun, and they would expect the people to pay them for the elaborate rituals. And to make their rituals valid, the adepts would always claim that the sun obeyed their prayers thereby convincing the people of their need to keep the adepts around. The people, I mean the sheeple, would continue to pay tribute to these adepts as long as they appeared to be successful. Now, folks, if the adepts knew that the sun was a symbol of something that the people would not support, such as a belief that Lucifer, the devil, was the god that they worshipped, they would have to continue with their charade so that the people would not decide to stop worshipping. Because if the sheeple figured it out, they would no longer support their activities. They would have to keep their beliefs from the people and conceal their secret worship in hidden symbols. So sun worship as a religion prospered. Mr. Hutchins discussed that position in his book, and I also discussed it in mine, Behold a Pale Horse. Mr. Hutchins says this, quote, In the tabernacle, the brethren, clothed in black, mourn Osiris, who is representative of the sun, of light, of life, of good and beauty. They reflect upon the way the earth may again be gladdened by his presence, unquote. Mr. Pike connected the sun to Osiris, mentioned by Mr. Hutchins as worthy of being mourned. Quote, The three lights at the altar inside the Masonic Temple, represent Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris was represented by the sun, unquote. Mr. Mackey went a little further and informed his readers that, quote, Osiris was the sun, unquote. In his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, Carl H. Cloudy, the author, himself a Mason, connected the sun worship with the ceremonies inside the Masonic Lodge. Quote, the Lodge sets him, meaning the initiate, upon the path that leads to light, but it is for him to travel the winding path to the symbolic east, unquote. The physical sun rises in the east, and the Masons explain that their search for light begins in the east, and notice that Mr. Cloudy capitalizes the word east, apparently in reverence to the spot where they believe that this God resides. The Masons tell the world that they circumambulate, defined as walking around, the temple floor during their initiation ceremonies. Mr. Cloudy explains why this rite is performed. Quote, when the candidate first circles the lodge room about the altar, he walks step by step with a thousand shades of men who have thus worshipped the Most High by humble imitation. Thus thought of circumambulation is no longer a mere parade, but a ceremony of significance linking all who take part in it with the spiritual aspirations of a dim and distant past, unquote. And it is a historical fact that the Knights Templar also performed the circumambulation of their temples. 
And he further instructs his readers as to why this ceremony is part of their ceremony. Quote, Early man circled altars on which burned the fire which was his god, from east to west by way of the south. Notice that the north is not included in the ceremony. The significance of that omission will be discussed later. But circumambulation became a part of all religious observances, unquote. In another part of his book, entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, Mr. Cloudy reported that this style of walking was traceable to the ancient religions of the past. And he wrote this, quote, Circumambulation was the ceremonies of ancient Egypt, unquote. So this practice of the modern Masons is based upon the ancient pagan religious practices of the ancients. So the Masons are telling us that early man walked around in a circle because he was worshipping the sun, then they tell us that they are doing it for the same reason. There are reasons that the North as a location to be visited in their walk around the temple floor is not included in their initiation rites, and six of the great Masonic writers have told us why this is so. Captain William Morgan offered his readers this explanation with this comment from his book, the writing of which he was murdered for. Quote, we therefore Masonically term the North a place of darkness, unquote. Mr. Mackey confirmed that statement in his book. Quote, the North is Masonically called a place of darkness. And Mr. Pike confirmed the comments made by the other two Masons with this declaration. Quote, to all Masons, the North has immediately been the place of darkness, and of the great lights of the Lodge, none is in the North, unquote. And Kenneth Mackenzie added his confirming thoughts. Quote, the North was always esteemed a place of darkness, unquote. Mr. Hutchins became the fifth Masonic writer to confirm this detail. As he said this, quote, As in other degrees, the closing ritual provides a summary of the lessons taught in the degree. We hear in the West the eagles gather and the doom of tyranny is near. In the South, Truth struggles against error and oppression. In the North, fanaticism and intolerance won. In the East, the people begin to know their rights and to be conscious of their dignity and that the sun's rays will soon smite the summits of the mountains. Unquote. Mr. Hutchins informed his readers that the North was where fanaticism and intolerance resided. What he meant by this, and what the symbol of the North represents, will be explored later. And the sixth Masonic writer who confirmed that the North was a place of darkness was Carl Cloudy, who wrote in his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, quote, the place of darkness, the North, unquote. And the reason the Masons do not include the North in the rites is found in the Bible, in the Bible, the reason the Masons do not include the North and their rites is found in the Bible in Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 13. Quote, I, meaning Lucifer, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the North. Unquote. The God of the Bible sits in the North and Lucifer hopes one day to acquire the throne of God for his throne. But until then, the North is a place of darkness. But while the North is an excluded territory, the East is the place of light, and is to be revered, Mr. Hutchins tells his readers why that is so. Quote, the East, the source of light and thus knowledge, unquote. Albert Mackey quotes Etienne Francois Bazat, a French Masonic writer, in his encyclopedia. Quote, the veneration which the Masons have for the East bears a relation to the primitive religion whose first degeneration was sun worship. Unquote. Rex Hutchins then tells his readers that the Masons deploy lights around the lodge room during the initiation ceremony for the 25th degree called the Night of the Sun. And he writes, quote, the ceiling should be decorated to represent the heavens with the moon, the principal planets in the constellations Taurus and Orion, a single powerful light, a great globe of glass representing the sun is in the south. 
In a physical sense, the greater light comes from the sun, and the transparencies provide lesser light. Symbolically, the sun, or great light, is the truth, and the lesser lights are man's symbolic representation of truth." Unquote. Mr. Mackey further discusses this right of circumambulation, as he calls it, in his encyclopedia. He says that the right, quote, exists in Freemasonry. The people always walked three times round the altar while singing a sacred hymn. In making this procession, great care was taken to move in imitation of the courts of the sun, unquote. He then assisted the reader with understanding this practice in the Masonic temples. Quote, this rite of circumambulation undoubtedly refers to the doctrine of sun worship, unquote. However, in another of the books that he wrote, Mr. Mackey directly states that the rite is connected to sun worship. This is what he wrote in a book entitled Manual of the Lodge. Quote, the circumambulation among the pagan nations referred to the great doctrines of Sabaeism or sun worship, unquote. Sabaeism is defined by Mr. Mackey in his encyclopedia as, quote, Sabaeism, the worship of the sun, moon, and stars, the host of heaven. It was practiced in Persia, Chaldea, India, and other oriental countries at an early period in the world's history, unquote. He then added this rather cryptic comment. Quote, and although the dogma of sun worship does not, of course, exist in Freemasonry, we find an allusion to it in the rite of circumambulation, which it preserves, unquote. Now, one can understand what Mr. Mackey meant by that comment. The Masons do not worship the sun. They worship the sun, <laughs> with a capital S. So he was telling the truth, but concealing it in a symbolic language, for he wrote son with a small s. You have to understand the symbology of the mystery schools, or you will never understand anything, dear listeners. Mr. Hutchins then volunteered the information that in the twelfth of the thirty-two degrees, the rite of circumambulation is preserved, and he writes, quote, in all the Scottish Rite degrees thus far, the candidate has made 21 prescribed circuits around the altar. This degree adds 7 for a total of 28. And this practice, called circumambulation, is derived from the ancients and existed among the Romans, Semites, Hindus, and others. It is thought to have been a rite of purification. The sun was believed to travel around the earth. The initiates imitated the movement of the sun when they made circuits around the altar, unquote. Furthermore, dear listeners, in the ninth degree, other symbols of the sun are involved in the ceremony, and Mr. Hutchins tells his readers, quote, After the obligation is taken, the nine candles of yellow wax are lit. Yellow is representative of the sun, hence light and knowledge. In the tenth degree, further symbols representing the sun are utilized according to this author. Quote, there are three sets of five lights. The wax is yellow, meaning knowledge, and also as the color of the sun represents the deity. Unquote. A blatant admission. But the sun represents the deity that they worship. Other clues that the sun and the serpent are both known symbols of the Masonic Lodge are given by the titles of two of the 32nd degrees inside the Masonic Lodge. The 25th degree initiate is called a Knight of the Brazen Serpent, and the 28th degree initiate is called a Knight of the Sun, with a capital S. There is another symbol of the sun inside the Masonic Lodge, the Worshipful Master. The equivalent of the president of the lodge sits in the east side of the temple, and we are told why that is. Quote, the worshipful master represents the sun at its rising. The senior warden, another officer of the lodge, represents the sun at its setting. And the junior warden, still another officer of the lodge, represents the sun at meridian, the halfway point, the most high. Other individuals and organizations besides the Masonic Lodges are also involved, folks in various varying degrees, with sun worship. 
are with an acknowledgement that the Son plays a central role in their understanding of the nature of the world. Elizabeth Clare Prophet has been described as being a leader in the New Age movement, and she has written this in a newsletter she publishes called The Coming Revolution. Quote, the healing of the nations begins with the healing of ourselves. We must draw forth from the great central sun that eternal light with which we were anointed from the beginning, unquote. Adolf Hitler, I'm sure you've heard of him, the head of the German government prior to and during World War II and who was directly responsible for the murder of over 50 million people, was also a sun worshiper. Very early in his life, he joined a secret organization called the Thule Society. And 40 years after the war, some historians are finally delving into its strange beliefs. Two of these writers, Michael Bertrand and Jean Angelini, have produced a book entitled The Occult and the Third Reich. And one of their conclusions is, quote, In the Nazi cosmology, the sun played a prime role. As a sacred symbol of the Aryans, in contrast to the feminine and magical symbolism of the moon revered by the Semitic peoples, unquote. The Nazi Party was the name of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the party that Mr. Hitler joined. It became the controlling party of the German government prior to and during the war. The Fuhrer, German for leader in this case, meaning Mr. Hitler, saw in the Jewish people with their black hair and swarthy complexion the dark side of the human species, while the blonde and blue-eyed Aryans constituted the light side of humanity. Hitler undertook to extirpate, meaning to eliminate, from the material world its impure elements, to lead it back to glory. But sun worship, as the Masons point out, is not new. The Bible talks about it as well. Folks, Ezekiel was an old world testament prophet writing sometime during the period of 571 to 592 B.C. And he tells about how he was taken by God to see a practice occurring near the temple. And this is what he wrote in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. Quote, and he, the Lord God, brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Unquote. And Ezekiel points out that the Lord God considered this practice an abomination. There is another reference to sun worship in the Old Testament, this time in Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verses 2 through 4, and then verse 7, and that reference reads as follows. Quote, If there be found among you, man or woman, that hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either the sun or moon, or any of the host of heaven, and it be true that such an abomination is wrought in Israel, so thou shalt put the evil away from among you. Unquote. So, folks, the God of the Bible has made it perfectly clear that sun worship is something that he does not want. He does not want his creatures practicing this. The Bible even went so far as to say in both instances that he considered the practice to be an abomination or an evil. But to show just how far this practice has invaded the Christian community, the following prayer was offered up at a recent funeral in a local Christian church. Quote, Now you will feel no rain, for your mother, the earth, will fold her arms around you. Now you will feel no cold, for your father, the sun, will always warm you. Unquote. Sun worship continues. Because some Christian churches pray to the sun god in their church services and don't understand who they are praying to. Simply stated, simply stated, dear listeners, the sun god that they were praying to is Lucifer. Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. Wakes you up, doesn't it? See, all the time you thought religion was something 
stupid. Didn't have anything to do with overall world events, but you're wrong. Has everything to do with everything. Whether you believe it or not, whether I believe it or not, doesn't make any difference. If the people who have the power and are in control believe it, it will affect us all. Understand that. Because that's true. It's time, folks, to talk once again about Swiss America Trading Corporation. It is the only, <laughs> it is the only corporation that I recommend where you can place your assets and get real worth back in return that will help you through what's coming in the economic collapse that is just on the horizon. If you followed my broadcast for any length of time, you know that I've been bringing you this show mostly devoid of sponsorship simply because I couldn't find any sponsors that I believed in and could recommend to you. Except for the Pilot Connection and Backwoods Home Magazine, because I've got strict criteria. I mean real strict. And so we found Swiss American Trading Corporation. In part, folks, I've been leery of allowing just any corporation to buy time on my show, but I'm proud, really proud, to announce this new alliance. Swiss America Trading Corporation and myself are committed to preparing my listening audience, that's you, for the upcoming economic trauma. And believe me, it will be a trauma. For over 11 years, Swiss America has been supplying over 10,000 clients with hard assets and constant information on how best to protect their assets. For a limited time, interested listeners can receive a complimentary newsletter if you mention my name, William Cooper, and ask for information on protecting your future. Call 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646, and do it now. Good night. And God bless each and every one of you. Good evening, folks at home and around the world, and welcome to another edition of the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper, and I strongly suggest that you have pen and paper by your side all during this episode of the Hour of the Time, for I'm going to be giving you a complete bibliography. You see, folks, I own a library that is better than most city libraries in this country, and I'm going to give you the names authors, and publishing companies of the books that will start you off to bring you up to speed to where I am at. And you're just going to get what you need to get you to a beginning level tonight. I suggest, if you can, that you tape record this episode of the Hour of the Time so that you can play the tape back and refer to it. If you do not have the facilities to do this, you may order a studio-quality stereo tape Done on a digital mixer from Stan Barrington. I'll give you his phone number so you can call him and talk to him about this later. I'll also give you the address. And for those of you who want to know the price right off the bat, for CAGI members, it's $7.50, and that includes postage and handling per tape. For everyone else, it's $17.50, and that also includes postage and handling. I need to take just a couple of moments here, folks, to tell all of those who have sent in your membership fee and your application to become a member of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, the largest and most successful civilian intelligence gathering network in the world, that you need to be a little bit more patient as we've had some problems on this end. You see, we live in a rural area, and our print shop, the one that makes up the press credentials for us, takes care of all of the printing in this whole part of the state of Arizona, literally. And so when we take in an order, it goes to the end of the line and sometimes takes quite a while for the job to be finished, to be completed. Now, we've taken that in consideration this time, and we've ordered way more than we can possibly use for quite some time. Now, <laughs> when we got the job back just the other day, our hard disk crashed on the computer uh, that we used to do all of the documentation for each member. Now, the documentation that we send out to you is really top quality stuff, and we don't want to do it on a typewriter. We could have had all your membership packages out to you. Uh, we could have done it on a typewriter, but you would not have been happy with that, especially if you ever were to see what the other members who have already got their packages have received. So we're going to ask you to be a little bit more patient. Most of the people, and I mean this, most of the people who sent in membership applications have already received theirs. 
Uh, we have held back all of the foreign orders for membership simply because we have to delete any uh, reference to allegiance to the Constitution of the United States of America, simply because we cannot ask someone who lives in a foreign country to uh, back the Constitution of a country that, that they don't live in. I wouldn't want anyone to do that for me. So we're redoing all the membership documents for people who live in foreign countries. And uh, they, too, are going to be very happy when they receive their membership kit. Now, one of our members, one of our most recent members, uh, has already attended a vice presidential press conference as an accredited member of the press representing the CAGI News Service. So, folks, uh, when you get your package and when you use your press credentials and find out that your uh, letters of validation and the, um, the, the backup that you get from us when you need it, uh, will really get you in to these press conferences and to these uh, events that you normally would not have access to, I think you're going to be very happy that you that you waited. Um, once we get the hard disk back from Los Angeles where we sent it to be repaired, then we will load the software back onto the disk and to get everybody's membership package out to them up to date right to that minute uh, in about two or three days from the date that we received the hard disk back from um, the repair facility in Los Angeles. So I want to thank all of you for being patient. For all of you who have been wondering what's going on, uh, now you have the answer. Those of you who have uh, called, you already know that. We at this end sincerely apologize for any inconvenience that this delay may have caused anyone. Please be patient, and now let's get on with this episode of the Hour of the Time. Folks, if you've been listening to the Hour of the Time for some period now, then you know that we've only really had two sponsors, and the rest of the airtime has been paid for by myself, Stan Barrington, and many people who have sent in donations, some of them quite substantial, and I take this moment now to thank every single one of you who have pulled your share of the load to make this show possible. Because I'm going to tell you right now, my family at Stan Barrington could not have ever come up with all the money needed to keep this show on the air. And the only two sponsors we've had have been Backwoods Home Magazine, which sponsored one program, and also the Pilot Connection, which I believe sponsored four programs. So uh, the rest of the airtime was paid for personally, out of my pocket and out of Stan Barrington's pocket, and all of you wonderful people who sent in donations to keep this show on the air. From the bottom of our hearts and from the heartfelt thanks of all of the people out there who really depend upon this show to come into their homes five nights a week, we thank you sincerely. We appreciate your efforts, and we know that some of you did without some things in your own lives to make those donations possible. We now have a sponsor, folks, and this sponsor has paid for two weeks of airtime, which is a substantial amount of money. Now, we would not take this sponsor had we not conducted a full background investigation on this corporation and on the people who belong to this corporation. And they pass with flying colors. They not only have all of the recommended investments that you've heard me talk about on this show, but they have a lot of others that you might be interested in. Some of them we don't recommend, but again, as we've always told you, don't believe what I tell you. Don't believe what anybody else tells you. Don't believe what you read. Don't believe what some salesman's going to suggest. You have to make up your own mind, and you have to do it from a ground level of knowledge. They have everything there for you. They know what you need. They know what I believe, and they have told me and assured me that they're not going to steer you wrong, and I believe that they're telling me the truth. Now, if they do, perchance, I want you to call me right away. Let me know immediately, because if anything happens that's not right with this sponsor, we'll drop them like a hot potato. But I'm telling you right now, they passed every test that we could give them and we believe that this is a good chance for all of you who have been asking me how to protect your assets, how to survive the depression that we're in and the coming economic collapse. I'm talking about Swiss America Trading Corporation. In part, I've been very leery of allowing just anybody to buy time on my show, and the result has been that we just haven't had any sponsors, folks. 
Not that people haven't applied to be sponsors. Many have. We've turned them down. But I'm now proud to announce this new alliance. Swiss America Trading Corporation and myself are committed to preparing you, the listening audience, for the upcoming economic trauma. For over 11 years, folks, Swiss America has been supplying over 10,000 clients with hard assets and constant information on how best to protect their assets. For a limited time, those of you interested can receive a complimentary newsletter if you tell them that you heard about this in the hour of the time from me, William Cooper. Ask for the information on, quote, protecting your future, unquote. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. One more time, 1-800-289-2646. Invest one hour in reading this information because it's one of the most important publications of our times, and I think you're going to agree when you see it. Now, you all know what's coming, so if you don't do anything about it, you've been asking me what my recommendation is, you just heard it. It's up to you. It doesn't cost you anything to call. The information is free. No one's going to bug you, and you don't ever have to do anything else if you don't want to. Okay? Okay, folks, the first thing in the bibliography that need, you need to get started, I'm going to recommend to you, is a book. This is a thick book. The title of it is Our Ageless Constitution. Our Ageless Constitution. Now, I'm not going to say these things, so I'm going to repeat everything twice, but I'm going to keep on going because I've got a lot of information to give you. Either make a uh, tape of this broadcast or order the tape. Or if you can, write fast and get the information down, but get it, because you need to read these books. You need them for your personal library. Uh, you need them to know what's going on in the world and who's bringing it about. Our Ageless Constitution, edited by W. David Stedman, S-T-E-D-M-A-N, and LaVon G. Lewis. It's part of the Stedman Liberty Library, published by W. David Stedman Associates. Now, I don't know where you can order this book from, folks. I got it as I always get my books from used bookstores, from people who find something and send it to me, from scrounging in thrift shops, from uh, new bookstores. Um, I have a library that's unbelievable. Most of you would be awed by the books that I have. Most of my income throughout the years has gone toward... Uh, stocking this library simply because I learned a long time ago that the sum total of all man's knowledge is contained in books but you have to root it out not all books are true not all books tell the truth not all books are all lies it's sort of a mixture but you have to have the information available to do the research and come up with the answers okay now once you've got that book you have everything you need to know about the history, the ideals, the purpose, everything behind the founding of this country. And if you don't know that, you don't know anything about this country. So you need it. The next book that I'm going to recommend, because you need to know the symbology and the history and who these people really are, is a book that was originally printed in the 1700s. In fact, the beginning... Um, it's called the um, the Templar's Chart, the Masonic Chart, the Templar Chart, and the beginning has a letter to the editors of the New York Express, and it's signed by Benjamin Franklin. Uh, it's a very old book. It has the complete history, according to Freemasonry, of Freemasonry. It's entitled, and this is the title of the book, The True Masonic Chart, or Hieroglyphic Glyphic Monitor, containing all the emblems explained in the degrees of entered apprentice, fellow craft, master mason, mark master, past master, most excellent master, royal arc, royal master, and select master, designed and duly arranged agreeably to the lectures by R.W. Jeremy L. Cross, G.L., to which are added illustrations, charges, songs, etc., with additions and emendations. Also, a complete history of Freemasonry by a brother. 
This copy that I have is the 12th and stereotype edition printed in New York, uh, published by A.S. Barnes & Company, 51 John Street, in 1854. You can find treasures like this if you look. Most people, though, sit back and say, Oh, I don't know where to find it. I don't know anything about doing research. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> That's not the way to do it, folks. Not the way to do it. The second book I'm going to recommend here that you get is a book by Joseph Campbell, probably the world's foremost authority on myth and mythology. This book is entitled Primitive Mythology, The Mass of God. Again, it's by Joseph Campbell, Primitive Mythology, The Mass of God. And I believe it's printed by Penquin, Penquin Books. Okay. Next one is also by Joseph Campbell, Occidental Mythology, The Mass of God. It's by Joseph Campbell, entitled Occidental Mythology, The Mass of God. Also published by Penquin, Penquin Books. And I've got all these books stacked up around here, so if you hear a moment of silence, it's because I'm reaching for something. Uh, I literally have surrounded myself with stacks of books. I'm going to give you the title, author, and uh, publisher of as many as I can, uh, starting with the most important for you to use to get started with and working on that. Next one is by Joseph Campbell again. The title is Creative Mythology, The Masks of God. Creative Mythology, The Masks of God, also by Joseph Campbell and published by Penguin Books. The next one, folks, is The Sacred and the Profane. The title is The Sacred and the Profane. The subtitle is The Nature of Religion, The Significance of Religious Myth, Symbolism, and Ritual Within Life and Culture. And it's by Mirsai... Iliade, Mirsai Iliade. It's actually translated from a foreign language. It's printed by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. Next one is an important book. Once you get to, once you get into the symbology of mystery schools and the occult, you learn that geometry and hermetic science become very important. Now this book is entitled Occult Geometry and Hermetic Science of Motion and Number. Occult Geometry and Hermetic Science of Motion and Number. A combined edition by A.S. Riley. A.S. Riley. And this is uh, published by Divorce. Divorce Publications, that's spelled D-E-V, as in Victor, O-R-S-S. -S. And uh, there's some treasures in these books. Now, these are books that most people pass by. They look at them and say, oh, this is, this is boring, or I would never learn anything from that. And most people would never even pick up one of these books. But I'm telling you folks, you better start. Next one is entitled Celestial Symbols. Celestial Symbols. Symbolism and Doctrine, Religious Traditions, and Temple Architecture by Alan H. Barber. Alan H. Barber. And this is published by Horizon Publishers. Sometimes you get to understand that even the names of the publishers and sometimes the name of the authors are symbolic. Horizon, as you've already learned, means Horus rising. Horizon Publishers and Distributors Incorporated, P.O. Box 490, Bountiful, Utah. And that book contains some revelations. Another one is entitled... Many Moons, Many Moons, The Myth and Magic, Fact and Fantasy of Our Nearest Heavenly Body, by Diana Bruton, introduction by Colonel James Irwin of the Apollo 11 Mission. 
Oh, yes. It's very interesting. Very interesting. And this is published by Princess Hall Press, New York, London, Toronto, Sydney, Tokyo, Singapore, so I know you can find this book. Now, we're going to get into some other areas now, and I'm going to attempt to sort of explain to you some of the things that are in these books. And you need to start with some history. The first book that I want to recommend to you is entitled Holy Blood, Holy Grail by Bijant Lincoln and uh, Lee. Bijant, Lincoln, and Lee. Holy Blood, Holy Grail. The next one is The Messianic Legacy. The Messianic Legacy by the same authors. By Jean, Lincoln, and Lee. And then there's another one called The Temple and the Lodge. The Temple and the Lodge. By the same authors. And then the fourth one by these authors also is called The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception. The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception by the same authors. Now read those books. Read them in that order. The last one just came out. I've just ordered it myself. I've not read it, but I know because I've read the other three that uh, I need to read it and it's going to be just as revealing as the first three. Now none of these books put together the whole picture. I've done that. But they all have pieces to the puzzle that you need to find for yourself so that you'll know that I'm not leading you down the garden path. That's important. Now, in that series of books, folks, it outlines the history, as they have discovered it, of a secret society whose sole purpose is to protect the bloodline of the family which traditionally throughout history has claimed the divine right to rule the rest of us. It's important that you know about that family because the same people <laughs> also rule this country, folks. They're all related. If you haven't figured that out yet. And if you want to find out how related they are, start looking into an organization organized in Cincinnati called the Knights of the Golden Circle. The Knights of the Golden Circle. The next book that I want you to pick up and read is entitled Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. A biography by Michael Grant. Now, in this book, it outlines the a lot of things about ancient Rome, their political machinery, the way that Rome was really ruled by families, which is going to be the same way in the New World Order, I can guarantee you that, and it talks a lot about the ancient religions in this book. It's very revealing. It's a biography, it's factual, it's not uh, fiction at all, and you need to read it. The next book is an extremely important book and puts a lot of pieces of the puzzle together. And the person who wrote this book didn't actually set out to even write about this subject. What he was doing was trying to research the peasants' revolt in England and ended up writing a book about Freemasonry because of what he found out in his investigation into the peasants' revolt uh, in England. And that man is John J. Robinson. John J. Robinson. The title of the book is Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. I'm just going to read to you a little bit from the, uh, the dust jacket here. Its mysterious symbols and rituals had been used in secret for centuries before Freemasonry re revealed itself in London in 1717. Once known, Freemasonry spread throughout the world and attracted kings, emperors, and statesmen to take its sacred oaths. 
It also attracted great revolutionaries such as George Washington and Sam Houston in America, Juarez in Mexico, Garibaldi in Italy, and Bolivar in South America. It was outlawed over the centuries by Hitler, Mussolini, and the Ayatollah Khomeini. But where had this powerful organization come from? What was it doing in those secret centuries before it rose from underground more than 270 years ago? And why was Freemasonry attacked with such intense hatred by the Roman Catholic Church? This amazing detective story answers these questions and proves that the Knights Templar in Britain, fleeing arrest and torture by Pope and King, formed a secret society of mutual protection that came to be called Freemasonry. Based upon years of meticulous research, this book solves the last remaining mysteries of the Masons, their secret words, symbols, and allegories, whose true meanings had been lost in antiquity with a richly drawn background of the bloody battles, the opportunistic kings and scheming popes, the tortures and religious persecution that were the Middle Ages. It is an important book that may require that we take a new look at the history of events leading to the Protestant Reformation, and you've already heard <laughs> about that on this show. But you need this book, Born in Blood, The Lost Secrets of Freemasonry. Get it. The next book is by the same author, John J. Robinson. After he wrote Born in Blood, he was intrigued. And so he wrote Born in Blood about Freemasonry. Then he had to go back and research the history of the Knights Templar. And he wrote this book entitled Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. The Knights Templar in the Crusades by John J. Robinson, author of Born in Blood. And I'm going to read to you from this flyleaf, but, uh, yeah, I will. Over the past thousand years, the bloodiest game of King of the Hill has been for supremacy on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the site of the ancient Temple of Solomon. This book recounts the stirring saga of the Knights Templar who were called the Christian warrior monks who occupied the sacred mount in the aftermath of the butchery of the First Crusade, recruited to a life of poverty, chastity, and obedience intended to lead only to martyrdom on the battlefield. They were totally dedicated to the pious paradox that the wholesale slaughter of non-believers would earn the eternal gratitude of the Prince of Peace. The Templars amassed great wealth, which they used to finance their 200 years of war against Muslims on the desert, in the mountains, and up the broad sweep of the Nile Valley. The Templars' reward for those two centuries of military martyrdom was to be arrested by Pope and King, tortured by the Inquisition, and finally decreed out of existence. But their legend and legacy just would not die. In telling the incredible story of the Knights Templar, the author's clear explanation of the cultural and religious differences among the Templars' enemies and friends in the Middle East gives fresh understanding of the people who populate this restless region. Here are the Sunnis and the Shiites, the Kurds, the Armenians, the Arabs and Turks, who figure so prominently in today's headlines. The similarity of their antagonisms today and those of 800 years ago are often so striking as to be eerie. Dungeon, Fire, and Sword is a brilliant work of narrative history that can be read as an adventure story, a morality play, or a lesson in the politics of warfare. But, folks, be careful when you read these books that you do not believe them blindly. For sometimes the authors are taken in by the exoteric, but you still need to read them. Don't go away, folks. We've got to take our break. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Welcome back, folks. This is William Cooper for Swiss American Trading Corporation. Now, you've never heard me advertise any product or anyone or anything on this show unless I could solidly recommend it to you. I would use it myself, have checked it out, and know and believe that it is a good thing for all of us. And I'm not about to start now. How about a company, folks, that's been in business for over 11 years? How about a company that delivers non-confiscatable, non-reportable, hard assets directly to your door? They don't store them in a vault so they can be ripped off like George Green just ripped off everybody who sent him money to buy hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of dollars worth of gold, which he kept. Well, he took the money and ran, folks, just like I always said he would, but Swiss American Trading Corporation will not. How about a company that writes a newsletter that openly deals with the imminent economic collapse? 
How about a company who considers privacy and discretion an integral part of their relationship with their clients? Folks, this is Swiss American Trading Corporation. Now, if you call right now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. I'll say it one more time. 1-800-289-2646. Right now. And state that you listen to the hour of the time. You listen to William Cooper. They'll send you their complimentary newsletter entitled Protecting Your Future. And the only obligation you have, folks, is to commit a quality hour into reading and considering the information in this newsletter. So call right now, 1-800-289-2646, and tell them William Cooper sent you. And now, folks, we continue with our bibliography. I hope you've all got pen and paper and you're writing just as fast as you can. Don't worry if you don't get them all. If you just get some of them and start reading, this will count. You can always order this tape and play it back and copy them down at your leisure. At some future date, we will print a bibliography, but right now, I'll tell you the truth, folks, we just don't have time to do that. We're so much engaged in producing this radio show and research, and I'm writing a second book and traveling and speaking and I'll tell you something right now. I barely have time to talk to my wife, and she doesn't appreciate that too much, so <laughs> we're going away this weekend. The next book, The Future of Man. The Future of Man. Once again, The Future of Man by Robert Clark Graham. Robert Clark Graham. You can order this book for $7 from SC Books. P.O. Box 1562, that's P.O. Box 1562, Friendswood, Texas, Friendswood, Texas, 77546. Once again, $7 for this book from S.C. Books, P.O. Box 1562, Friendswood, Texas, 7754. Four, six. Well, I'm really going to have to hurry to get uh, a <laughs> substantial amount of these books in. I hear somebody out there screaming and pulling their hair. I can't possibly read all these books. Yes, you can. I've done it. I've read every book in my library, folks, and my library is bigger than most city libraries. If I can do it, you can do it. The only thing that will stop you is because you don't want to do it. And if you learn how to do productive research, some of them you don't have to read the whole books, believe me. You just have to learn how to do that. But you have to understand what the context of the book is before you take anything out of context. You can get in big trouble doing that, believe me. Next book is A History of Mathematics. A History of Mathematics, second edition, by Carl B. Boyer. That's A History of Mathematics, second edition, by Carl B. Boyer, B-O-Y-E-R. And the foreword is by Isaac Asimov. And this is published by Wiley. W I L E Y should be able. In fact, you should find that in most good bookstores. It should be on the shelf. Next one is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Be very careful about the Dead Sea Scrolls, folks, because everybody who's had their hands on them has been in the pay of the Rockefeller family, and the people who are translating them now are in the pay of the Rockefeller family. And they say that some of them have leaked out, and that you're getting the the real version. You don't know that. This could have been intentional leaks, and nobody. None of us know how to really translate these things. So the Rockefellers basically are telling us what the Dead Sea Scrolls say, and I can just about tell you what they're going to tell us right off the bat, that Jesus didn't die uh, and all kinds of things. And, and uh, well, just wait and see. Just wait and see. This is called Understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls. Understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls. A reader from the Biblical Archaeological Review, edited by Herschel Shanks. Herschel Shanks, and this is published by Random House. Now, I'm going to go a little speedy here because I don't have much time left, folks. And I want you to get as many of these as you can. Next one is Pagans and Christians. Pagans and Christians. This book is worth its weight in gold if you want to understand the early history of the church and the antagonism between the early church, the early Christian church, and the pagan religions. Pagans and Christians by Robin Lane Fox. Robin Lane Fox, published by Knopf, K-N-O-P-F. Get it, read it, you won't regret it. 
The next one is uh, that alarm you just heard go off is the bread maker. <laughs> the loaf of bread is done, and I'm fixing to have a hot slice of bread with fresh butter on it as soon as I finish this broadcast, folks. Preparing for the 21st century. Preparing for the 21st century by Paul Kennedy. Published by Random House. Now, that's a modern book about modern things. You still need to read it. Next one is a very important book. Printed in 1798, it has been reprinted by the Americanist Classics. The Americanist Classics, published by Western Islands, Boston, and Los Angeles. You can find this book easily. It's called Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robison. A.M. 1798. Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robison. A.M. 1798. The Americanist Classics, published by Western Islands, Boston, and Los Angeles. If you didn't get anything else I ever told you, get that book and read it. Another one that's very important is called Time Bomb. Time Bomb give you the roots of the Liberty Lobby in the spotlight and uh, America uh, Free Radio and will open your eyes on the Nazi influence in this country. Time Bomb by Pillar, published by Arco. Arco. And this is <laughs> very revealing. Another one, uh, well, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not going to risk misquoting it. Uh, this one is The New World Order. The New World Order, The Ancient Plan of Secret Societies. This is called The New World Order, The Ancient Plan of Secret Societies by William T. Still. William T. Still. And uh, who published this book? Let me see here. Huntington House Publishers. Published by Huntington House Publishers. Pick it up, read it. Remember, there's a lot of books called The New World Order. That's just one. I'm going to give you another one with the same title here in a few minutes. The next one is En Route to Global Occupation. En Route to Global Occupation. A high-ranking government liaison exposes the secret agenda for world unification by Gary H. Ka. Gary H. Ka. And this also is Huntington House Publishers. The next one is... Uh, pretty good, called Dark Majesty. Now, this author, Tex Mars, has published a plethora of books about the coming New World Order. Unfortunately, he really laces it with his own religious viewpoints, and that's okay because he's got a lot of hard facts in here, but it tends to turn some people off and they don't want to read the books because of that. If you're a Christian, you will have no problem reading this book. If you're not, you may have some problem with the religious beliefs of Tex Mars. But if you can struggle with that and get through it, uh, it will open your eyes and you will get a lot of good facts from this book. It's called Dark Majesty by Tex Mars, The Secret Brotherhood and the Magic of a Thousand Points of Light. You see, he understands this uh, quite a bit like I do, only I don't try to foist my religion off on the rest of you. I'm a Christian, but I'm a different kind of Christian. I'm a Christian only in that... I believe in the Ten Commandments as given to Moses by God and the actual words attributed to Christ. Whether he lived or died or was the Son of God or was just a man walking on this earth, uh, I believe that what he said is the most profound utterances ever spoken on this earth, whether they were ever spoken or not. Folks, and I try to live my life by the Ten Commandments and by those words that Christ uh, is credited with having spoken. The next word is Satanic Voices, Ancient and Modern. Satanic Voices, Ancient and Modern. Compiled by David Musa Pidcock. David Musa Pidcock. Now, <laughs> this author is the head of the Islamic Party in Great Britain. So, again, you have his fundamental religious beliefs mixed in this book, with a lot of cold, hard facts, which I have checked and double-checked, and are absolutely true. So, if you, again, like the other book, if you can get past the religious viewpoint of the author and look at what the history of this thing is from his viewpoint and the facts that he delivers in this book, then, uh, <laughs> believe me, you'll be way ahead of the game. 
Uh, it's published by Musta King, which I believe is the Islamic party in Great Britain. And uh, Musta King publishes Islamic art and literature. Now remember what I told you a long time ago. If you don't want to read opposing viewpoints or books written by people who believe in different religions or different gods than you do, if you don't want to uh, read something that was written by a blatant communist, uh, then I'm telling you right now, you're going to be whipped in this war. You're going to be beat down and enslaved in this war because you won't know anything about your enemy. You won't really know what the truth is because you'll be stuck, held prisoner in the dogma of your own beliefs. And I mean that, folks. A lot of us have been believing a lot of things for all of our lives that are absolute, total lies. And once you start your own research, you can find that out. And you're going to be probably as angry as I have been at times in my life. And you may do some stupid things like I have done at times in my life, which is one reason why none of you should ever, ever put me up on a pedestal, because I'm just like you. <laughs> I'm just like you. I'm not any different. And I, and I may be a lot more human than most because I've gotten in touch with something inside that lets me feel and express my anger and my emotions and things that most people aren't in touch with. So when I'm angry, I scream and yell. But five minutes later, it's all over with. <laughs> don't put me on a pedestal. I'll fall off immediately and you'll all be disappointed. So if you don't do it, nobody will be disappointed. The next book is called The Unseen Hand. The Unseen Hand, An Introduction to the Conspiratorial View of History, by A. Ralph Epperson, my good friend, who lives in Tucson, who's going to be a guest on this program here in about a week or two, and we're going to try to do uh, maybe three or four episodes of the Hour of the Time with A. Ralph Epperson. This book, The Unseen Hand, is, is uh, an incredible piece of work, and I highly recommend it. The next book is also by A. Ralph Epperson, and I've used this book extensively during our revelation of the mystery schools and mystery Babylon um, in our series, our ongoing series. It's called The New World Order. The New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson. Get these books. Read them. If you can't find them, just wait. He'll be on this show pretty soon, and uh, we'll give you a phone number and an address and a price, and you can send off and Get them directly from him. This next book is extremely revealing. In fact, anything that this author has ever written, you should read. In fact, there's a center, uh, a study center set up in Los Angeles called the Philosophical Society, which was founded by Manley P. Hall. That's the name of the author, Manley P. Hall, 33rd degree Freemason. Anything that he's ever written, get it and read it. This particular book is called Freemasonry of the Ancient Egyptians. Freemasonry of the Ancient Egyptians. Another good one to read that he wrote is The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. And anything else that you can find that's been written by Manly P. Hall, get it and read it. Make sure you understand the symbology. Don't get caught up in the exoteric bullshit because that's the way they hide the real meaning. Another one, because a lot of the mystery tradition is wrapped up in what they call the Kabbalah, which is the, uh, the ancient uh, Jewish version of the mystery schools. And don't get me wrong, folks. Not all Jews are involved in this. Not all Catholics are involved in it. Not all Protestants are involved in it. Not all blacks. Not all Arabs. Not all whites. But some of every one of them are deeply involved in this. There are the people who worship Lucifer. If you worship Lucifer, you can be a member too. This book is called Judaica. Judaica. The Blackwell Dictionary of Judaica. This is the Blackwell Dictionary of Judaica. By Dan Kahn and Sherbach. Dan Kahn and Sherbach. And it's published by Blackwell. Blackwell Reference. Published or uh, printed in Great Britain by T.J. Press, Padstow Limited, Padstow Cornwall, but you can still order this from any bookstore. The Blackwell Dictionary of Judaica uh, by Dan Kahn and Sherbach. Make sure you get it because a lot of the Kabbalistic uh, words need definitions and you can find them in this book. Next one is a Dictionary of Freemasonry. A Dictionary of Freemasonry. 
a compendium of Masonic history, symbolism, rituals, literature, and myth. A Dictionary of Freemasonry by Robert McCoy. Robert McCoy. This book is worth its weight in gold if you know how, again, to interpret the symbolism and get at the esoteric meaning instead of the exoteric writing. Some of you are already know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea what I'm referring to, but you will find out once you get into this. Another book that's worth its weight in gold is called The Mystery Religions. The Mystery Religions and Christianity. The Mystery Religions and Christianity by Samuel Angus. Samuel Angus, published by University Books. Published by University Books. The Mystery Religions and Christianity by Samuel Angus. And we want to thank uh, our member, Spencer. Thank you very much. Spencer supplied us with this volume. Next one's been around for a long time, but again, is worth its weight in gold. But you have to understand, again, the symbolism to read these books. A lot of these books were not meant for us to read and understand. They're meant for an adept, an initiate, to understand. This is A History of Secret Societies, published by Citadel. A History of Secret Societies, published by Citadel, by Arkan Darul. Arkan Darul, D-A-R-A-U-L. Arkan, A-R-K-O-N, D-A-R-A-U-L. The Citadel Press, New York. A History of Secret Societies. Again, worth its weight in gold. The next one is The Occult Conspiracy. The Occult Conspiracy. Now, this book was written by someone who is in sympathy with the secret societies and may be a member, although I doubt from reading this. It doesn't sound like he is, but he is definitely in sympathy with them. So be careful when you read this that you don't get the wrong message. The Occult Conspiracy, Secret Societies, Their Influence and Power in World History by Michael Howard. That's Michael Howard. And this is published by Destiny Books, Rochester, Vermont. And the uh, logo of Destiny Books is the sun and the moon. <laughs> that should tell you something. Next one is America's Secret Assignment. Excuse me, I'm wrong. America's Assignment with Destiny. There's two books, and I had this confused with another one. The other one's called America's Secret Destiny. Throw that one out. That's total crap. <laughs> that is esoteric from the word go all the way to the end. This one, though, you need to read. America's Assignment with Destiny by Manly P. Hall, and you will not believe what your eyes are telling you that your brain is reading. For this is an incredible book. It has incredible admissions, and you will begin to understand certain things that happen in history that you never could understand before. America's Assignment with Destiny by Manly P. Hall, and this is published by PRS, whatever that is. Let me look in here and find out so that you'll know. Philosophical, I should have known this. Oh, man, I feel stupid now. Illustrated, second printing, Philosophical Research Society Incorporated. This is Manly P. Hall's organization. America's Assignment with Destiny by Manly P. Hall. Get it and read it. Another one that's extremely important that you read this book. Many people pass it by, snub their nose at it. Don't ever do that, folks. You're making a big mistake. This is the New Age Bible. The New Age Bible by Dr. John Rogers. The Hidden Truth Revealed. Just the symbology on the cover will send you reeling after you've listened to uh, the episodes of the Mystery Religion of Babylon that we've already revealed on this show. This is published by Inner Light Publications. Inner Light Publications. The New Age Bible by Dr. John Rogers. The Hidden Truth Revealed. Get it? And read it, folks. Another one you need to read, which will connect someone else with all of this, if you can understand the symbology again, is called The Mormon Murders. The Mormon Murders by Stephen Nypha and Gregory White Smith. A true story of greed, forgery, deceit, and death. Read this book. Now, here's a catalog that you need to get because you can get a lot of books that you need from this organization. It's catalog number 2A. Catalog number 2A, send $6 to Health Research, 
Mailing address is P.O. Box 70. That's P.O. Box 70. 8349 Lafayette Street. 8349 Lafayette Street. Mokalumne Hill, California. M-O-K-E-L-U-M-N-E. That's M-O-K-E-L-U-M-N-E. Mokalumne Hill, California, 95245. That's Health Research, P.O. Box 70, 8349 Lafayette Street, Mokalumne Hill, California, 95245. Good night, folks. I hope you get these books. I hope you start your own library, and I hope you wake up. God bless each and every single one of you. Welcome once again, folks, to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. We'll start off tonight's show with the Socialist National Anthem. (laughs) Oh, I love it. The Socialist National Anthem, born under a bad sign. Folks, tonight's episode of Mystery Babylon, the 18th hour, I'm going to take directly, verbatim, from Chapter 9 of A. Ralph Epperson's book called The New World Order. He's going to be a guest on this show soon, and you'll know why once you hear what, uh, what we've got to say tonight, so pay attention. And remember, as always, as always, just because I'm giving you this series on Mystery Babylon doesn't mean that you're supposed to believe what I'm telling you blindly. That's why I gave you the bibliography last night. You've got to go out and find the truth from your own research. I'm the only one that ever tells you that. Everybody else wants you to believe verbatim what they say because they're saying it and they're who they are. And I'm telling you not to believe anybody, not even me, not even your own mother, unless you can verify it in your own work, your own research. Make sure that you do it, too. Before we start, folks, remember, remember, all of you have been asking me what to do with your assets, how to save your assets, how to survive this depression that we're in now. Make no mistake, we're in a depression, and it's going to get worse. In fact, we're headed for a total economic collapse, what I predicted years ago. And I, I called the shots on this recession that went into a depression to the exact month, to the exact month when it would begin, and it began right on schedule exactly when I said it would. And I was the only one that told you the banks would not fail on December the 19th. And I told you that on a show I aired on December the 6th. (laughs) Folks, I hate being right. I'm telling you, this is the truth, I hate being right. I'm probably the only one in the world who doesn't like being right because it does not portend well for us. Now, if you want to know what to do with your assets, you call Swiss America Trading Corporation and do it right now. You know me. I do not advertise anybody that I don't wholeheartedly believe in, would not recommend to you, with no reservations. And I never, ever allow anybody to sponsor this show unless I, myself, personally use their product. So, call Swiss America Trading Corporation. We've checked them out top, bottom, backwards, forwards. Every way that there's possible to check somebody out, we've done it. It's a good company. They're good people. They believe like I do. They believe like you do, the listeners to this show. They've been in business for over 11 years. They deliver non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets directly to your door. They have a newsletter, a good newsletter that openly and unequivocally Without pulling any punches, they deal with the imminent economic collapse that's coming. They will treat you and your business with the utmost privacy and discretion, which is an integral part of their relationship with all of their clients, not just you, but everyone who does business with them. This is Swiss America Trading Corporation, folks. Call them right now, 1-800-289-2646. There's no obligation. You're going to get something for free, and you don't have to give anything to them if you don't want to. So call 1-800-289-2646. Once more, 1-800-289-2646. Tell them that you listened to the hour of the time and that William Cooper sent you. And they'll send you their complimentary newsletter entitled, Quote, protecting your future, unquote. Ask for it. Make sure that you get it. The only obligation that you have is to commit an hour to reading this report, this newsletter, and considering the information that you find in it. And I guarantee you that you will enjoy reading it. It will open your eyes to some things that you may not have considered before. And then you can make a decision on what you're going to do with your assets. 
Now, you know what I've recommended, and if you don't know, call Stan and get the tapes concerning the Federal Reserve and the economic collapse that I've done, because I'm not going to keep saying the same things over and over and over again. I may rerun those at some future date when I need a break, but I'm not going to continually repeat these things. So, most of you know what I've recommended. And I also told you that I'm not a financial advisor. I recommend those things through my own research and through the research into history as to what's been valuable in deep depressions that we're going to be going into. But you make up your own mind and you invest the way that you want to, not the way that I recommend if you don't agree with me. Understand? That's what this show is all about, folks. It's about getting you to think on your own, getting you to challenge what you've been taught and what you've been told, but in all cases, doing your own researches, making up your own mind, and coming up with your own gut truth. That's important. Now, if the truth is really the truth, in this process, most of us should come up with the same answers. That's why I'm so adamant about this. Swiss American Trading Corporation, folks, 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. No obligation on your part. They're going to send you a free newsletter. Read it. You'll like it. You don't have to do anything with them if you don't want to. But I recommend that you do. Now, the Bible, folks, discusses a being called Lucifer in both the Old and New Testaments, and we're going to be talking a lot about the Bible tonight because we have to look at this from every point of view. We've looked at it from the mystery schools. We've looked at it logically. We've looked at it historically. Now we're going to look at it from the Bible's point of view, but not strictly from the Bible's point of view. But you need to know this. The Bible discusses a being called Lucifer in both the Old and the New Testaments. Other names for this creature are Satan and the devil. One of the first explanations of just who this being known as Lucifer is is found in the Old Testament in a book written by the prophet Isaiah, who wrote around 740 B.C. He wrote that Lucifer was created full of wisdom and was perfect. He was created the anointed cherub that covereth the throne of God and that he actually was upon the holy mountain of God. He later corrupted his wisdom by reason of his brightness, the Bible then records that God cast him to the ground. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Unquote. And folks, this was the very first, very first recorded UFO sighting. If indeed it was a sighting at all. Notice that the fall of Lucifer weakened the nations of the world, and this will be examined in other chapters of this study. Quote, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mound of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High, unquote. Luke, a writer in the New Testament, records in Luke, Chapter 10, verse 18, that Jesus said that he beheld, quote, Satan as lightning fall from heaven, unquote. Peter records in 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 4, that God has, quote, spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down, unquote, as well. Paul, another New Testament writer, wrote this about Lucifer in 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 14, in about 57 A.D. Quote, And no marvel, for Satan is transformed into an angel of light, unquote. And in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 9, Paul wrote that Satan was capable of working, quote, lying wonders, unquote. In around 90 A.D., John, the author of the book known as Revelation, wrote in Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9, that Satan was a, quote, dragon, unquote. Lucifer shows up in the original site of human habitation on earth called the Garden of Eden. The creator, God, placed Adam, the first man, and later Eve, the first woman, in this garden, but told them that there were certain rules that they had to abide by. And these are spelled out in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Quote, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, unquote. 
Later, Lucifer spoke through his serpent to Eve, but in reality to both men and women. Quote, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Unquote. So from the above information, it is possible to glean a little knowledge about the nature of Lucifer. One, he was cast down from heaven because he desired to ascend directly into the seat of heavenly power, the throne of God. Two, he is referred to as the son of the morning. This appears to be a reference to Lucifer being similar to the sun, which also rises every morning. His desire, number three, his desire is to sit on the north side of the mountain of God. Lucifer can deceive the world. This is number four. Lucifer can deceive the world because he has been transformed into an angel of light. And five, Lucifer can work lying wonders. Now, with those basic understandings, folks, of Lucifer in place, it will be possible to examine the views of others about this fallen entity. However, not all agree with the picture of Lucifer being evil. For Albert Pike wrote this, quote, There is no rebellious demon of evil, our principle of darkness, and an eternal controversy with God. Unquote. In fact, Mr. Pike believes that Lucifer was not a force of evil, but could be a force for good, and he wrote this in Morals and Dogma, which I forgot to give you yesterday in the bibliography. That's another one. Write it down, folks. Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. He wrote this in Morals and Dogma, quote, For the initiates, those initiated, initiated into the true secrets of masonry, this is not a person but a force created for good, but which may serve for evil. Unquote. To further amplify that belief of Mr. Pikes, it becomes important to quote a letter that he wrote on July the 14th, 1889, to the 23 Supreme Councils of the world. Judging from the contents of this letter, it appears that Mr. Pike was attempting to tell the leaders of the various Supreme Councils all over the world that they were to know that Lucifer was the secret god of the Masons. This letter clearly indicates that he believed the position that Lucifer was a god who had come to earth for the good of mankind, and he wrote this, quote, That which we must say to the crowd is, presumably Mr. Pike meant that the crowd was all of the non-Masons of the public at large, That which we must say to the crowd is, We worship a god, but it is the god that one adores without superstition, unquote. So it appears that one of the purposes of this letter was to advise all of the top-ranking Masons that they were to concoct a story that the Masons worshipped the traditional God so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a nun-god, by the name of Lucifer. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their God whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out. Well, of course, folks, they're sworn to secrecy. They have to deny anything about the true secrets of their order. I mean, what kind of logic is this? That's plain as the nose in your face. You must understand that when you ask a Mason a question about Freemasonry, he's going to tell you a lie because he has sworn to secrecy, and he has sworn by blood oaths. And I know that by the time they've reached the 32nd degree, they've taken at least 32 different oaths swearing them to secrecy. Minimum. So, you should know this already. Now, let's continue, but I'm going to go back and read that part over. It appears that one of the purposes of this letter was to advise all of the top-ranking Masons that they were to concoct a story that the Masons worshipped the traditional God so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a nun-god by the name of Lucifer. It's very important. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their god whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out, as I and many others have done, as A. Ralph Epperson has done. So the secret inside the Masonic Order is that Lucifer is their secret god. 
Any non-Mason today who attempts to explain to any of their Masonic friends or relatives that this is the secret inside the Lodge will be met with an instantaneous denial. Every Mason, whether they know the secret of the Lodge or not, will obviously deny the accusation because they must. Mr. Pike continued, quote, You may repeat it to the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine, unquote. You see, Albert Pike at that time was at the head of all the lodges of Freemasonry of the world and at the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States of America. Here Mr. Pike seems to indicate that it is the 30th, 31st, and 32nd degrees that are to be taught the Luciferian doctrines. The direct evidence that the honorary 33rd degree is formally taught that Lucifer is the great architect of the universe will be presented later. But here Pike seems to say that that lesson is to be taught at an earlier degree. Quote, if Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians and the Jews, and his priests, Calumniate, which is defined as spreading false and harmful statements about or to slander, would they calumniate him? Pike makes two incredible statements about Lucifer. One, he is considered to be a god, and two, the priests and the rabbis have it all backwards and are all slandering his name. As has been illustrated, the Bible states that Lucifer is nothing more than a fallen cherub. He's not a god. Yet Mr. Pike clearly states that Lucifer is a god. Now how can that be? And secondly, those who claim that he is the wicked one are slandering him. Those individuals have it all wrong. And Mr. Pike continued, quote, The true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. Unquote. Adonai also spelled... Well, in the first place here, it's spelled A-D-O-N-A-Y, and it says Adonai, also spelled A-D-O-N-A-I, is the Hebrew word for God. To show that Pike was referring to the God of the Bible, he wrote this in his book entitled Morals and Dogma, quote, Adonai, the rival of Baal and Osiris, unquote. In other words, Adonai is Typhon. That's an aside for me, folks. That's not written in this book. But as you've been listening to the series that I've given you, you know that Adonai, if this is true, if he is the rival of Baal and Osiris, then he is Typhon. As has been illustrated, Osiris is the sun god, and the sun has been shown to be a symbol of Lucifer. Adonai is the rival of Lucifer, both in the Bible and in the writings of Albert Pike. Quote, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil, unquote. And here, once again, Mr. Pike writes that Lucifer and Adonai are rivals, and that the religious world has it all backwards. Lucifer is the good God, and Adonai is the God of evil and darkness. The author would like to interrupt the narrative to make an observation, and this observation is being made by a Ralph Epperson, not me. He wrote this book. That authenticity of that letter by Albert Pike that was just quoted has been questioned by a variety of writers. It has been reported that Mr. Pike made these comments in an encyclical hand-carried to the meeting of 23 Supreme Councils of the World on July 14, 1889 in Paris, France. This author, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, is willing to concede that the only evidence for the contents of this encyclical consists of it being quoted in a book written by a Frenchman named A. C. de la Rive, entitled La Femme et la Infant dans la Ranc Mecon, Mecon Neri Universelle. I'm not a French speaker, folks, so that's the best I can do. My tongue doesn't do those things. Or at least, I haven't practiced to make my tongue do those things. That title translated from French to English means, The Woman and Child in Universal French Masonry. A copy of that page that contains that quote and the cover of the book has been supplied to this author, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, by a concerned researcher who had someone locate the book in France for him and make copies of the pertinent pages. The author has read another book that contains the English translation of that encyclical. That book is entitled Occult Theocracy and was written in 1933 by Edith Starr Miller. She cites the book 
by Mr. de la Rive as her source. She obviously believed that the letter was true and contained the actual thoughts of Mr. Albert Pike. He said it in so many other places, including in his own book, Morals and Dogma, that I also believe that the letter is true, and now I'm speaking as myself, William Cooper. In other words, going back to A. Ralph Epperson's words, in other words, the only source for the letter is a Frenchman who quotes it in his book and not Mr. Albert Pike himself. It must be assumed that Mr. Pike, if he were alive today and was asked whether the letter was his, would deny that he ever wrote such an encyclical, whether or not he had written it, because he must. He is sworn to maintain the secrets. But the reader is admonished to remember that if he did indeed worship Lucifer and wrote the encyclical, he would certainly have to deny it, so that answer would tell the researcher nothing. It is the contention of this writer, A. Ralph Epperson, and others who are attempting to decipher the secret symbols of the Masonic order that a small percentage of the Masons know that all of the symbols inside the lodge refer to Lucifer. And I am one of those who believe this, folks. My research has shown it to be absolutely true, and I can prove it. And I've already... I've already uh, given you direct quotes from many Freemasons that already prove it. And it must be remembered that these Masons must, of necessity, do all that they can to deny any, any revelation of any of the secrets of the lodge. And certainly anyone today who believes that the contents of the letter are a fraud would do all that they could to discredit anyone who said that the thoughts were the actual thoughts of Pike. However, this writer, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, is of the opinion that Mr. Pike did indeed worship Lucifer and is not basing that conclusion on just this one letter. Notice that Mr. Pike has written elsewhere that he considered Lucifer to be the secret god of the Masonic Lodge, and I, William Cooper, have also found that to be true. Not only in one or two, but in many instances. So it is not essential to this writer's, A. Ralph Epperson's, position that this encyclical be proven to be valid. It is the author's contention that there is ample evidence from other sources, including from Masons other than Mr. Pike, that the secret God inside the Masonic Lodges is Lucifer, and I wholeheartedly occur with Mr. Epperson. That evidence is available to anyone who cares to locate it. But there is another Mason who knows that Lucifer is the good God of a particular segment of the Masons, Pike's fellow 33rd degree Mason, Manley P. Hall, also felt that this God was a God of good. He wrote in his book entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages, quote, Sun worship played an important part in nearly all the early pagan mysteries. The solar deity was slain by wicked ruffians who personified the evil principle of the universe. By means of certain rituals and ceremonies, symbolic of purification and regeneration, this wonderful God of good was brought back to life and became the savior of his people, unquote. This God who came back to life is not the Jesus of the Bible because Mr. Hall refers to him as the solar deity. He is referring to the death and resurrection of Osiris covered in detail in the Masonic rituals. And I've already, I've already relayed to you who Osiris really is. In fact, in this series on the mystery religion, I've proven it time and time and time again. But Manny P. Hall has further identified Lucifer as the god of some of his fellow Masons. He has written this in his book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. It's one of the books that I gave you last night, folks. When the Mason, quote, when the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of the living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy, unquote. Mikhail Bakunin, the Russian anarchist, also addressed this question of evil and good gods, and he wrote, quote, The evil one is the satanic revolt against divine authority, revolt in which we see the fecund, defined as being fertile, germ of all human emancipations, the revolution. Socialists recognize each other by the words, In the name of the one to whom the great wrong has been done, Satan, folks, is the eternal rebel, the first free thinker, and the emancipator of worlds. He makes men ashamed of his bestial ignorance and obedience. He emancipates him, stamps upon his brow the seal of liberty and humanity, and urging him to disobey and eat of the fruit of knowledge, unquote. You see, I've been telling you all along that socialists and the mystery religion of Babylon are the same 
the same, the same, and now in his book, A. Ralph Epperson has proven it. That thought that Lucifer was a good spirit to whom a great wrong was done is the basic thought that holds the New Age together according to Tex Mars, the author of two major books on the subject. And he has written, quote, Many New Agers commend Lucifer because by tempting Eve he enabled man to evolve toward enlightened knowledge and godhood, unquote. Remember I told you that with the gift of intellect man will develop technology that will make him God? They are working feverishly in laboratories now to uncover the secret of immortal life. Mr. Mars discusses the thoughts of a leader in a mystical organization called the Stell Group. How many times have I mentioned that? The Stell Group. Named Eklal Koshana. He writes that this New Age leader says that, quote, Lucifer is the head of a secret brotherhood of spirits. The brotherhood is named after Lucifer because the great angel Lucifer has been responsible for the abolishment of Eden in order that men could begin on the road to spiritual advancement, unquote. Lars Hansen was reared in the Stell group. Lars Hansen was reared in the Stell group. Tom Valentine was a member of the Stell Group. Tom Valentine wrote a book called The Life and Death of Planet Earth. Get it and read it, folks. Tom Valentine was associated with the Communist Party. Now he's a member of the Liberty Lobby, which came right out of the old German Nazi Bund. They used to sing the Horst Wessel song at the beginning of their meetings. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up. Why do you think every time somebody calls Tom Valentine and asks him by free, about Freemasonry and their complicity in the conspiracy, he covers it up and hangs up on the person as quickly as possible and denies that there's any complicity of Freemasonry? Now, this makes me a little hot under the collar. I've got to cool down a little bit, so we're going to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Well, of course, I needed that little break. I'll tell you right now, Tom Valentine has been attacking me for years because he knows that I know who he is and what he's about, that I know the origins of the Liberty Lobby, that I know their message is that our government is no good, it doesn't work, that it's turned against us, and it's all lies. For it's the people who are in these secret societies who have turned against us, who are delivering that message to us to get us to voluntarily overthrow or get rid of our own government, the only government in the history of the world that has ever set man free. And I'm the only one who lets you know this. It's not our government. It's not the Constitution. It's not the Bill of Rights. It's not the structure. It's the secret societies. It's the Tom Valentines. It's the Bogreitzes. It's all of these people who belong to Freemasonry. The Ancient Order of the Rose and Cross and the Knights Templar, the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, and many more, many more. Socialist, international socialism, under many, many different names. You see, folks, you see, <laughs> the Senator was right. Senator McCarthy was absolutely right. He was correct. He just didn't know the proper name. He thought he was ferreting out communism. He wasn't. You see, if he understood what I understand, then he would have survived the attacks of the very people that he was trying to ferret out who owned the media that turned against him and destroyed him. Hollywood, who turned against him and destroyed him through manipulating the opinion of the public. See, communism, folks, is just a word. It's another boogaboo enemy. <laughs> the real enemy, folks, is mystery Babylon. I could never say what I said tonight before, because if I had, it would have been misinterpreted. I had to have independent verification that the Stell Group worshipped Lucifer before I could reply legitimately to the tax upon me by Tom Valentine. 
because if I had told you what I know without independent verification, all of you would have turned against me as being a poor sport or some other bullshit. It's a real load off my chest to be able to deliver that message to you. I can tell you that right now. Real load off my chest. Let me continue. Remember, this is chapter 9 of A. Ralph Epperson's book, The New World Order. So there is a basic disagreement about the nature of Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. The Bible depicts him as a force for evil, and Mr. Pike and others pictures him as a force for good. But the connection between Lucifer and the ancient mysteries needs to be further amplified. The mysteries had a purpose, to create a Superman. Where have you heard that before? Hitler said it. And they're working in secret laboratories right now toward the same goal. The mysteries had a purpose to create a Superman, one capable of understanding the true nature of the universe and to worship the true God. W.L. Wilmshurst, a Mason, wrote these thoughts in his book entitled The Meaning of Masonry. Quote, this, the evolution of man into Superman was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, and the real purpose of modern masonry is not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into more godlike quality, unquote. And need I say as an aside here what a Freemason said to a friend of mine who was his son? He said... Son, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. And, of course, the son was not one of them. And with great credit, has never become one of them. W.L. Wilmshurst amplified this thought a little later in his book. Quote, man who has sprung from the earth, meaning that he was not created by a creator God, and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state, has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a God-like being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient to promote, which is and always has been the sole aim and purpose of initiation, unquote. And he goes on, quote, No higher level of attainment is possible than that in which the human merges in the divine consciousness and knows as God knows, unquote. <laughs> what have I been telling you all this time, folks? So just as Satan tempted mankind with the ability to know good and evil themselves, just like God, without his assistance, now the Masons are teaching that they too could become a God through an initiation into the ancient mysteries. John Anthony West, in his book Serpent in the Sky, wrote this in support of Mr. Wilms' first statement. Quote, Egypt started with the concept of divine attributes within man. The gods are not brought down to earth, rather man is raised to the gods, unquote. Others, besides the above-mentioned Masons, like Louis Furbach, have joined the discussion with similar thoughts. He was a 19th century philosopher and a hero of the communists like Karl Marx. In fact, Frederick Engels, the co-worker with Karl Marx during the time Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto as a hired writer hack, wrote this about his friend. Quote, all the communists of 1845 were followers of Furbach. The reason that the communists supported the ideas of Fierbach is apparent when the student reads his writings, for he wrote, quote, Man alone is our God, our Father, our Judge, our Redeemer, our true home, our law, and our rule, the Alpha and Omega of our life and of our political, moral, public, and domestic activity. There is no salvation save through the medium of man, unquote. John Denver, the well-known popular singer, has adopted this same philosophy about his divinity. He has been quoted as saying this after his new conversion. Quote, it's the single most important experience of my life. I can do anything. One of these days, I'll be so complete, I won't be human, I'll be a god, unquote. It's the same thing that's taught in the Mormon church. If a married couple produce many children and conform to the teachings of the church, then when they die, 
They will be gods, and they will be given a planet of their own, and they will continue their reproduction, only they will be souls, and they will populate the planet and will be the gods of the planet. What crap! What absolute crap! Where do these people get their egos? I'll be a god. Yeah, sure you will. <laughs> If you guys are all gods, then how come you still got to pay your bills? How come you get sick? And how come you got to go to the doctor? And if you go to the doctor, what's that make the doctor if you're God? Huh? You're all a bunch of fools. You're blithering idiots. You've lost your mind. Your egos have run away with the rest of you. And you're going to die like everyone else. And you're going to find out like everyone else. What really happens when people die? And as far as I know, no one on this earth really knows or is likely to know until it happens to them. Let that new pipe and smoke it. Mr. Hall, the Mason, stated a similar thought when he wrote this in his book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy. Quote, we may study the star intellectually, but we have never attained consciousness until we are the star. Unquote. <coughs> but this idea that man could become a god is not new. The Bible anticipated it, and Isaiah wrote about it back in 741 B.C. This is what he wrote in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Quote, Thus saith the Lord, Understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me, unquote. And once again in Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 5, quote, I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no God beside me, unquote. And remember, all the Roman emperors declared themselves God, and they all died like every other man died, some of them by the assassin's sword or knife. God, yeah, mm-hmm. Boy, you guys, just take the cake, I'll tell you. Now you can meet and, and throw that baloney around to each other and swallow it and pump each other up to believe that you're gods or you're going to be gods is beyond my understanding. The Bible teaches that there is but one God and that mankind has no possibility of sharing his Godhead. One who apparently has not believed those statements in the Bible is Shirley MacLaine, who has become a spokesman for the position that man can become a god. She has written several books on the subject of her support of the New Age. Newsweek magazine described her as the New Age evangelist, and she wrote the following statement in her book entitled Dancing in the Life, quote, We are part of God, unquote. And this elsewhere in the same book, quote, If one says audibly, I am God, the sound vibrations literally align the energies of the body to a higher attunement, unquote. Yeah, I bet it does. Yep, yep, I bet the insanity molecules take over every portion of the body, and you really all feel great until you have to go pay your rent. Or you catch the flu. Or somebody just knocks the crap out of you to try to bring you back to reality which is exactly what should happen when, when you do those kinds of things. What's wrong with just living life peacefully with other people and enjoying what we have? What's the big thing that you have to become God? And I'll tell you right now, you never will. You might as well just, well, never mind. If you want to be God, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're deceiving yourself, and that's okay, as long as you don't hurt anyone else. If each man is a god, mankind is capable of making decisions for their own welfare. Each man has complete control of his decision-making. According to Miss McLean, in fact, man's control is extended into areas few have ever claimed for mankind, and these are the thoughts of Miss McLean. Quote, I think we choose to be together. We choose our parents, and I think the parents choose the children they want to have before they ever come in to an incarnation, unquote. Tell that to an abused child. Tell that to a child who's raised by drunken, miserable, stinking parents 
They don't give a damn about the child. Tell that to all those people who know that that's total false, irresponsible ramblings of an insane maniac. And you know what they say when they're confronted with this? They say you agreed to it in a previous life and that you're, you're paying off your karmic debt. You see, they have a rationalization for everything. There's just more bullshit. More lies. More crap. She went on further to record another strange thought when she wrote this. Quote, there was no such thing as reality, only perception, unquote. Well, surely, let me tap you on the jaw with my fist, and then you tell me that there's no reality. Of course, I don't really want to do that, folks, but this is just a way to bring her to her senses. If it were legal, I might try it. Might try it. Might wake her up. Might show her that her perception is only reality. <laughs> One can only wonder where Miss McLean got these bizarre thoughts from. Several clues that can assist the student in understanding her have been given by either her own revelations or from some articles that have appeared about her in the media. In her book entitled Out on a Limb, she wrote about her meetings with her married lover in her apartment. <laughs> this God is breaking up somebody else's marriage, and uh, she's meeting with her married lover in her apartment. She commented that he looked at her shelf of books on, amongst other subjects, Marxist theory, including a biography of Karl Marx. There's nothing wrong with that. I have those books in my library and many more, many more. But knowing, knowing Shirley McLean, and folks, I do, knowing this scatterbrained twit, when she has books on Marxist theory, including a bar biography of Karl Marx, you can bet that she's a socialist. And of course she is. Grade Magazine of December 18, 1988, had an article on Miss McLean in which it revealed that her den had lots of framed pictures, surely with communist Fidel Castro and with communist Nikita Khrushchev, amongst others. The magazine reported how Shirley and her lover, quote, talked about democratic socialist principles and how it was possible to have them both at the same time if the rich would only share their wealth more. Elsewhere in her book, she wrote about how much of a hypocrite she was when she added this contradictory statement, and they all do, quote, wanted to talk to him about how I had made a lot of money and that it made me feel elite in a world that was broke to know I could buy just about anything I wished for, unquote. Just like Jane Fonda, who's been pushing for gun control for years who was stopped by law enforcement officers on the freeway, and her car was found to contain many pistols and weapons, firearms. Hypocrites and liars. However, nowhere in her book did she say that she had freely donated any of her own wealth to the relief of the poor. Apparently, she believes that the communist ideas about wealth sharing are acceptable only as long as she does not have to share her wealth like she wants the other rich to do. You see, most rich purport to be socialists, but in actual practice, none of them really are. None of them would give away their wealth to the poor, ever. Yet they pretend to be liberal, socialist, Marxist, in reality. They demonstrate that they are exactly the opposite. They are liars and hypocrites. For the whole communist socialist idea... It's for the little people, you and I, who are to be their slaves in the New World Order. Miss McLean has since gone on a nationwide tour promoting her newfound religious views to the public. Newsweek magazine reported in 1987 that she had made a great deal of money explaining her new thoughts to others. Quote, since McLean began her tour in January 1987, more than 10,000 people in 15 cities have paid $300 admission fee, unquote. Well, you know me, folks. I have absolutely nothing against that. If she could have got $1,000 ahead admission free, it would be okay with me. 
Now, 10,000 times 300 equals $3 million. I still have no complaint with that. This is the United States of America. If somebody wants it, give it to them. If they want to pay it, if they're that stupid, that's fine with me. I believe that people should be giving somebody something, though. But I also believe that if they're stupid enough to pay it, then they should be taken. That's how you learn. And a lot of people would disagree with me, but I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. That's what I believe. Obviously, Shirley's tours have proven to be both popular and lucrative. The Newsweek article on her seminar mentioned a little of what she teaches in the, the following of her few of her comments. Quote, the earth is moving off its axis, she says, and only the collective consciousness of mankind can right it. For the spiritually inclined, a window of light will appear on those days, August 16th and 17th, 1987, that McLean says will allow us to rise to a higher plane of cosmic understanding, unquote, pure bullshit, pure crap, pure new age mesmerism, if you will, for nothing happened on those dates. Evangelist McLean became Dr. McLean when she reported some of her new cures for two of the world's most serious medical problems, AIDS and cancer of the abdomen. According to the Newsweek article, she told our, her audience, quote, they, or those who paid to hear her in the 15 cities on the tour, all got to hear McLean's pronouncements on such subjects as AIDS. She thinks sufferers are sick because they have been bereft of love necessary to sustain the balance of health. And cancer, for cancer of the abdomen, she advises putting patients in a yellow room because yellow is the color frequency of that part of the body, unquote. More New Age mesmerism bullshit crap. And to think her patients only have to pay $300 for such wisdom. But Dr. McLean is not as dumb as one might think, the Newsweek magazine article reported. Quote, everyone who attended had to sign waivers absolving the seminar's organizers from responsibility for psychological injury, unquote. How clever, how clever of Miss McLean. So someone in charge of arranging her seminars is aware that her ideas might cause psychological damage to those attending, and they have moved to protect her from malpractice lawsuits. Now, not only was this New Age evangelist making money on her personal lecture tours, she was also making money on her best-selling books. Now, I don't know what's wrong with A. Ralph Epperson. I don't know why he's saying this, because he purports to believe in the Constitution and the principles and ideas upon the, which this country was based, and there is nothing wrong with making money on anyone's personal lecture tours are on their books, and I can tell you right now that A. Ralph Epperson makes money on his lecture tours and on his books, and that's how he makes his living. So as far as I'm concerned, that is a partial discreditation of A. Ralph Epperson. As of July 1987, her book entitled Out on a Limb had sold 3 million copies, and her other major seller, Dancing in the Light, had sold 2.2 million. Could he be jealous? Is it possible that A. Ralph Epperson is jealous of Shirley MacLaine's ability to sell books? Time Magazine reported that her five books on self-exploration and self-promotion have run to more than 8 million copies. Now, to me, that's admirable. If someone can write something that is so desirable by 8 million people that it sells 8 million copies, I don't care what they're writing about. That's admirable. She's providing an income for herself, her family, and people are obviously buying her books because they want them. Therefore, she's supplying them with a service. Whether it's bullshit or not, it doesn't matter. That's the American way, folks. That's what it's all about. There was a lot of people back in the early part of the century who hated automobiles. And therefore, Henry Ford was the devil. But he sold an awful lot of them. And he came under the criticism of a lot of people for doing it. Sorry, folks, that's the American way. As far as I'm concerned, what A. Ralph Epperson is spouting in these few sentences here is socialism. And I admire him for his research and what he's done, and I know that he makes his living selling books and lecturing. And for him to spout this socialist attitude when he is doing the same thing is not acceptable. And he is a friend of mine, and I will certainly bring this to his attention. You know, I read this book a long time ago, and I'd forgotten that he had said these things. 
but I certainly will bring it to his attention. In fact, we may talk about it on the air when he's a guest of the show, and he will be a guest of the show very shortly. So, you can look forward to some kind of an explanation of this. He says it appears as if selling the New Age religion can be very profitable. Well, Barnum and Bailey was very profitable, and it was all an illusion, just like the New Age religion. But in summary, perhaps the most cogent comment about the battle between the New Age and the Christians was made by Nesta Webster in her book entitled Secret Societies. Quote, The war now begins between the two contending principles, the Christian conception of man reaching up to God, and the secret society conception of man as God, needing no revelation from on high, and no guidance but the law of his own nature. And since that nature is in itself divine, all that springs from it is praiseworthy, and those acts, usually regarded as sins, are not to be condemned." Unquote. You've heard me say before that in the New World Order, the law will be, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And it will. The battle lines are drawn between those who believe in a creator God and those who believe that man can become God. These are the two opposing positions, and the battle between them, dear listeners, has most certainly begun. Now, don't get too upset over my criticism of the few paragraphs that A. Ralph Epperson wrote condemning Shirley MacLaine's ability to write books and lecture and bring in a lot of money. For I'm sure that in his zeal, which many of us get carried away with, in his zeal to condemn the worship of Lucifer and the secret societies, he carried it a little bit too far, but we'll bring it up when he's a guest on the show. For I'm a little bit curious about it myself, but I haven't jumped off the edge. Let's put it that way. Well, folks, you've all been asking what to do to save your assets. What? Where can you put your money? Where can you put your valuables? What can you do to survive this depression and the coming total economic collapse? That anybody with any brains can see has to happen. Unless they can convince us all to accept a cashless society, and that's the only thing that can save them. For without it, sooner or later, everyone's going to discover there is no cash, and it will all come tumbling down. Well, we found a partner to delve into this. Finally, after many, many attempts to get a sponsor for the show and rejecting many, many, many that we didn't believe in, couldn't accept, and that didn't fit our concept of what a sponsor should be or where you could invest your money safely. But we found Swiss American Trading Corporation. And you know me, folks. If I didn't believe in what they're doing, if I couldn't recommend them wholeheartedly to you, if I wouldn't use their services myself, then they certainly would not be a sponsor on this show. They've been in business for over 11 years. They can deliver to your door non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. They write a newsletter that deals openly with the imminent economic collapse. Doesn't pull any punches, tells it exactly like it is. They consider privacy and discretion an integral part of their relationship with all of their clients. This is Swiss America Trading Corporation. I recommend them wholeheartedly. But remember, you'll be talking to people who have their own ideas about what an investment should be, and you are the ones who should guide the conversation. You should ask for advice. You should do your own research, and you should dictate what you should buy from anybody. Remember that. Now call 1-800-289-2646 right now. 1-800-289-2646. Tell them you listen to the Hour of the Time with William Cooper. Tell them that William Cooper sent you, ask for their newsletter entitled Protecting Your Future. They'll send it to you. You have no obligation, folks. It won't cost you a nickel except the phone call. Do it. You're going to be surprised I guarantee it. You're going to enjoy this newsletter, and all you have to do is commit an hour in reading and considering the information that you get. So call 1-800-289-2646. That's 
1-800-289-2646. And tell them that William Cooper sent you. Good night, and God bless you all. Across America and around the world, you're listening to the Hour of the Time, the only hour that ever was or ever will be, for during this hour you will decide your future and thus our collective futures. I'm your host, William Cooper. Have you called Swiss America Trading yet? Are you one of the ones who are procrastinating? Are you the person who approaches me after I leave the lectern during my travels across this country to ask me how you can save your assets in the coming economic trauma? Well, if you are and you have not yet called Swiss America Trading, what's holding you up? Does it cost you anything except whatever the phone call is? And, folks, it's an 800 number, which means you don't have an excuse. You're going to get something free in return, chock full of information that you need to know. If, and only if, you mention my name, William Cooper, when you call. Now, you all know that we had to leave WWCR and begin broadcasting on WRNO because WWCR was burned to the ground in the early morning hours of April the 4th, 1993. And uh, you will be hearing us back on WWCR this coming Monday the 17th at our same old usual time. But all of this is due to the backing that we have from Swiss America Trading. Without them, you would not be listening to us now, and you probably would not be listening to us very much in the future. They've stuck behind us. They've backed us all the way. They believe in what this show represents. They're people just like us. Call Swiss America Trading. Talk to the experts there, folks. I want you to stand behind them just as they have backed us during these trying times. Swiss America Trading deals in protecting their clients, you, through non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. You've heard me inform you about the trouble this country is in, both politically and financially, and folks, the time to act is now. Call the experts at Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646, and have them show you how to protect yourself. Call 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. And folks, mention my name, William Cooper, and they'll send you a free newsletter on protecting your future. By protecting your future, you're keeping the future of this program and freedom for the world alive. Call today, right now, 1-800-289-2646, and you'll be glad that you did. If you are one of those who have been engrossed and have been following our series on the mystery schools, the religion, the ancient religion of Mystery Babylon, you are going to love tonight's program. And once again, it's going to prove that I have been right all along. So stay tuned, folks. Don't go away. Everybody look back in that corner at the far side of the room where it's real dark behind that chair. I'm going to turn on a very, very bright light, and I want you all to watch the cockroaches scatter. For tonight, I'm going to read verbatim to you from a book that we found in a dusty shelf far back in the rear of a used bookstore that proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that what I've been revealing to you in the segment, the many segments of the series entitled The Mystery Schools on this program, The Hour of the Time, has been not only true, but right on target. And the first time that this information has ever been exposed in its entirety to the people of the world. Now, you had better go to the used bookstores in your cities, and you'd better get there before the cockroaches get there, because I tell you now, they know that we are searching for proof, and that we are digging for the evidence that we will use in the future to hang them by their own rope. You need to get there first, and buy any and every book that is concerned with any and every secret society, mystery, religion, or cult that you can find. If you don't understand them, 
And if you don't want to use them to help us expose these people, then send those books to us, because we will put them to the best use. I'm holding in my hand an old, faded, what used to be red, hardback, covered book. It's almost orange now because it's faded with age. Entitled, Fundamental Laws, 68th Convocation. On the front of the cover is some of the symbology of the mystery schools. There is a rope representing the snake eating its own tail, also known as the magic circle. Within this magic circle, there is a triangle, actually three triangles, one within the other. Within the triangles, there is the symbol of the skull and bones. There is the symbol of wings around the world. There is the symbol of the ark, the anchor, and the three letters T-R-Y beneath the three triangles. This is the verbatim written report published in 1916, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm going to read to you from. Fundamental Laws, a report of the 68th Convocation of the Rose Cross Order, giving a resume of the proceedings of the Convocation, together with most of the lectures that were delivered during this time of the Convocation by the several delegates present. Also a report of the work of ancient initiation in the Grove of Osiris as especially prepared for the occasion. Below that is the symbol of a triangle with three stone steps representing the three degrees of initiation. Upon the top step is a cross, in the center of which is a rose. And beneath the triangle, again, the three letters, T-R-Y. This is copyrighted 1916, published by the Philosophical Publishing Company, Allentown, Pennsylvania, for the members of the Rose Cross Order. On the next page is a roll of honor. One of the names here stands out and almost knocked me over when I saw it, for the name is Lars Hansen. Now, it is not the Lars Hansen that we've discussed on this show, and we're going to look into it to find out if this was his father, our grandfather, our great-grandfather, could have been either one of the three. But we will find out, believe me. We know that Lars Hansen's parents were members of the Mystery School, and in particular, the Metternich Stell group, where Lars Hansen was reared. An explanation of the contents of this book, and I'm reading verbatim from the introduction and explanation. An explanation of the contents of this book, it is to be stated that these articles do not give the inner work of the Rose Cross Order, but simply the outer, the public teachings. Now, you'll remember in the Mystery School series, I taught you about the exoteric and the esoteric. What you're going to get in this book, because they never publish the esoteric anywhere, it's always hidden in symbology, but there are incredible admissions in this book that you will hear in the exoteric. Reading again, verbatim. The Illuminati and its soul science work may be called the child of the Rose Cross Order. Years ago it was found that where there was one person who desired to follow the work with heart and soul, in other words, who was willing to live the life as taught by the order, there were an hundred others who desired teachings from the order, but who were not willing to dedicate their lives to the sublime work. Now I break from this for a moment to remind you that I have previously stated that the fraternity of Freemasons, the ancient order of the Rose and Cross, the sovereign and military order of the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templars, the Mormon Church, all of these, the Illuminati, the order, the Skull and Bones are all the same organization. And what you have just heard is the first admission of that fact. And you are going to hear more as I progress. And remember, I'm reading this right out of their own publication. A hard-bound book published by the Philosophical Society in Allentown, Pennsylvania, specifically for the Rose Cross Order. Continuing. 
These thousands had to be taken care of, and as a result, the Illuminati and its soul science work was born. When in April, now that's April of 1916, folks, April of 1916, remember that. When in April, the order went forth to the brethren that a sacred convocation was to be held. All delegates were requested to prepare articles on soul science so that regular lecture sessions could be held. The lectures that follow are the result. All these lectures were given in open session and are to be considered as soul science work, though in entire harmony with the teachings of the Rose Cross Order. The work of the Rose Cross Order, as given to its students, can never be published. It is a secret, sacred work between teacher and student. Let me read that again for you. It is a secret, sacred work between teacher and student. It is a soul training, an inner initiation, and such work continues until the student has reached initiation, after which he is called upon to attend a convocation, and at which time the degree work is conferred upon him. But the inner work always precedes the outer work, as the outer work is only a bond binding together the brotherhood. Thus a word in explanation. Many having heard of the great order and its work, and actually knowing nothing of its inner work, have ignorantly or with fraudulent intent established so-called Rose Cross bodies. And these bodies, knowing nothing of the true work of the Rose Cross, have nothing but a ritualistic, initiatory, rite, or degree work. We would refer all seekers to authorities on the Rose Cross and on initiation, and they will then find that the true Rose Cross is actually a school of spirituality with a degree ceremonial initiation as the climax. And this is signed by the Hierophant of the Order. In the preface, early in the summer, instructions were received from the hierarchies to call the inner circle of the Rose Cross Order into session, and thus to fitly celebrate the 68th year of the Rose Cross Order in America. Orders were immediately issued to those who have the privilege of attending this convocation, and on June the 1st, 1916, the convocation was called to order and the preliminary lectures were started. At this convocation, all delegates were instructed to prepare and to deliver articles which should have a bearing on the conditions of the present day and which should be the means of helping humanity. However, because of the limited amount of time at the disposal of those who could attend, only a few were enabled to prepare such lectures with the results that there were not as many lectures delivered as might have been had the delegates had more time at their disposal. But even so... There were from two to three lectures each day, and most of these lectures will be found in this present volume, though many of the lectures cannot be given in book form, as they were only delivered as from teacher to those of the inner circle. From the beginning of the month until the day of the 13th, there were lectures in the assembly hall, which had been built in 1910 for the express purpose of holding these yearly convocations. But on the 13th, there were no lectures, as all of the day was required for making the preparations necessary in order that the ancient mysteries might be given to the delegates in a form of symbolism consisting of three degrees. I can do no better than to give the article prepared by Grace K. Morey of Buffalo, New York, the secretary of the Rose Cross Sacred College for the Buffalo, New York, papers and which appeared in the Buffalo Express July 16th, 1916. This is entitled, Ancient Mysteries of Egypt Given in an Initiation of Three Degrees. Play close attention, folks, for what you're going to hear now confirms much of what I have been revealing to you in the series on the Hour of the Time known as the Mystery Schools. Quoting from the book once again, under the authority of the Rose Cross Order founded in America in 1858, prominent delegates of the Order were gathered in the most remarkable conclave held during the last 5,000 years. The publication of whose records now opens to the world the connection of Egypt in her ages of true religion 
power, and glory with the mystic seal of the United States whose heraldic symbolism declaring the mighty destiny of America has until now only been known to a limited number. Not anymore. At Beverly Hall, in the beautiful Tohican Valley, about four miles from the town of Quakertown, men and women of all ranks of life and from all parts of the world, high masons and members of the Eastern Star, Physicians, teachers, authors, and members of all denominations, inclusive of the Hebrew, all these assembled at the call of the Grand Master of the Rose Cross Order for the 68th Convocation. And that should silence the cockroaches who are now scurrying from the light, who say that they are not all one order. They are known as the Brotherhood, the Order, the Ancient Order of the Rose and Cross, the Fraternity of Freemasons, and, of course, those of you who have been listening know the rest. Reading again from the book, Some years ago, R. Swinburne Clymer, author of The Philosophy of Fire, Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry, The Rosicrucians, Their Teachings, Mysteries of Osiris, Soul Science and Immortality, and over 30 other works, bought a mountainous tract of land, and on this was built, quote, Beverly Hall, unquote. An assembly hall, press rooms and libraries and chemical laboratory, which surrounded by orchards, vineyards, and rose gardens, set in terraced lawns, presents with its collie kennels and poultry plants a splendid combination of the beautiful and the practical. To this has been added the mystic, for in a secluded and wooded tract of fifty acres of this land, an artificial lake was made from a mountain stream, a throne room erected and other improvements made which would be needed for the initiation of neophytes in the Egyptian mysteries. The convocation was called to order on June 1st in the Assembly Hall, built over five years ago for that purpose, and the delivery of a series of lectures upon practical as well as mystical subjects began and continued until the close of the convocation. The delegates and teachers presented the lectures, which were followed by discussions upon the subjects of eugenics, scientific motherhood, code of ethics for the schools and home, spiritual Christianity, that's a joke, personal hygiene, diet and health, sin, authority and individuality, Jacob's Ladder, initiation, reincarnation, soul development, the second coming of the Christ, and the mystic significance of the seal of the United States. In the time of Solomon, as in the time of the Egyptian priesthood, no ceremony was ever held unless the circle of Solomon, commonly called the sacred seal of Solomon, had been previously prepared. But since the fall of Egypt and of the temple of Solomon, this seal has been practically unknown, except to a limited number of students of ancient religions and mysteries. Folks, the seal of Solomon is not the six-pointed star which is on the flag of Israel. It is not the seal of David or the star of David. It is not the seal of Solomon, as you will soon discover. During the first week in June, in the grove, especially prepared for the dramatization of the ancient mysteries of Osiris, the seal of Solomon, often called the Magic Circle, was especially built. And on June 11th, the dedication of the Magic Circle took place in the presence of the delegates of the Rose Cross Order, some of whom were natives of Germany, England, and Russia. This was in accordance with the system as practiced by the ancient priests of Egypt and the Sanhedrin of the Temple of Solomon. On the night of June 13th, the first session of the class, including those of the order taking part in the initiation, assembled in the Grove of Osiris, which was illuminated by electricity from a central powerhouse, especially prepared for the purpose and the initiation of the ancient mysteries of Egypt in three degrees and six scenes. All students of the ancient mysteries and religions know that in the Temple of Solomon there were three courts. The outer court for the people being composed of 700 selected teachers and leaders. 
These were members of the first degree. Illuminati called also seekers, travelers, or soldiers. The middle court, or members of the second degree, were seventy in number and were supposed to be in the hall of meditation and acted as mediators between the people and the inner sanctuary. Above all was the inner court, or circle of the seven priests, and the master, or high priest, who were the teachers between God and man, mediators between the seen and the unseen. In the Egyptian mysteries, the first court was made up of the royal youth of Egypt, and such students from foreign countries as desired to enter the temple and priesthood, and these during probation were often known as, quote, soldiers of the priesthood, unquote. As it was their duty while undergoing the preliminary training and test to guard the priesthood and its work even to the death. The second class, corresponding to a second degree, were those who had passed this test and who were in the hall of meditation and purification in preparation for the first vows and the dedication of the body, mind, soul, and spirit to God in the service of mankind. The third class, called the third degree, were those who had passed with credit the tests of the first degree, the purification of the second as well as the various stages of development required of all students in the halls of meditation. In the royal third degree, which took place in the temple, the neophyte received the final instruction. After this came the final test in the beautiful ceremony of the death of the old life, the giving up of the body and its temptations, and the raising of the slain Osiris, our spiritual body, by his faithful spouse Isis, the soul, with the final illumination. On the 15th of June, the first section of the representatives left Beverly Hall for their respective homes, and the second section began to arrive for the preparatory lectures, and on the 19th of June, the ceremonies were repeated so that all might witness the initiation and take part in it so as to become members. So far as can be learned, either through travel or history, never before since the fall of Egypt and its priesthood and the fall of the Temple of Solomon has there ever been a grove, a lake to represent the Nile, a magic circle, or a temple prepared, nor is it believed that anywhere in the world does there today exist such a circle. Nearest to this, however, is Stonehenge of the Druids of Britain, to which their descendants travel each year at a certain time to greet the sun and renew their vows. This is the first time, therefore, in five thousand years that any order has attempted to build up this sacred emblem under the stately oak so that people of modern civilization might witness the beauties of the life and religion of the ancient people whose teachings of individual soul development made the glory of Egypt, the lost dreams of all Israel, the teachings of the Magi of Persia, all that was true in India, the splendid philosophy of Greece, the magnificence of the early Romans, the basis of pre-Christian Ireland's great schools, as well as the familiar Holy Grail legends of Britain, Celt, and Gaul. In this light of brotherhood of man and fatherhood of God was founded this great republic foretold by Virgil, upon whose seal is set the Egyptian pyramid, completed by the white stone of spiritual purification as the crown of the ages. It's time for our break, folks. Don't go away, for I'll be right back after this very short pause. Well, I see some of you still have not called Swiss America Trading Corporation, and I can't help but wonder why not. What's holding you back? You profess to really, really get good, solid information from this show. You are all concerned about the coming economic collapse, and it is coming. You want to know how to protect your assets, and we've done everything we can to get you to call Swiss America Trading so that you can prepare for what's coming. Now, they have all the recommended investments that we've given you on this program. 
They have some that we don't recommend, and they have some that we don't know anything about. It's your money. You have to decide what you're going to do with it. But what I'm telling you folks is we've checked these people out. We've checked out Swiss America Trading. They're just like you and I. They're patriots. They care about this country. They backed this show, and no one else would have, would have done it. They need your business, and you need their help to survive the coming economic trauma. So pick up the phone right this moment. Don't wait. Pick it up now. Call Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. Do it right this moment. And invest the time it takes to read one of the most important publications that you'll ever get in your hands. Chock full of information. All you have to do, folks, is mention my name, William Cooper, and ask for the information on protecting your future. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did. In the winter, far beneath the snow, lies a seed that with the sun's love becomes the rose. Only those of you who have listened to the full series of broadcasts on the hour of the time of the mystery schools will understand exactly what that means. And you will know and have an entirely different understanding of that song, which is beautiful, to say the least, but does not convey the message that many of you have always thought you heard. You see, the mystery schools speak to each other in symbology, in a symbolic language that they have learned to use over the millennia to hide their real secrets, their real intent, their real work, which has always been from the beginning to reestablish on this earth an ancient government ruled by a council of wise men a benevolent despotism, a one-world totalitarian socialist government. Don't ever forget that, folks. If you love being free, the New World Order utopia is not for you. And it certainly is not for me. Continuing now from the book entitled Fundamental Laws, the publication of a report of the 68th Convocation of the Rose Cross Order, during which they admit the existence of the Illuminati, they admit the existence of the Order, they admit the existence of the Brotherhood, they admit that all of these secret organizations, including Freemasonry, are all the same organization, all working toward the same goal. An incredible admission printed in their own publication, a hardbound book found up on a dusty shelf way back in the rear corner of an old used bookstore. Such is the work of the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, CAGI. You too can become a member by sending $45 to William Cooper, Post Office Box 1420. That's Post Office Box 1420. Sholo. S-H-O-W-L-O-W. That's Sholo, Arizona. 85901. That's $45 for your membership to William Cooper, Post Office Box 1420, Sholo, Arizona, 85901. Also, I need to tell you, folks, Stan has retired. Please don't call his number. Please do not write or send orders to his old address. Stan got tired, and I don't blame him, and he has retired for the third or fourth time and probably the last. Stan did some incredible work for our cause and our organization. We always loved him. We will always love him. He will always be in our hearts. And we will, of course, miss him. Quoting again from the book, 
The American constellation of 13 stars set in the form of a double triangle was foretold by Merlin of King Arthur's court and the philosophy of the Holy Grail and of Egypt's glory and Solomon's temple has been the day star of every great American statesman from Washington to Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you've been listening to this program, you know the day star is a reference to Lucifer, the light bringer the angel of light, the morning star, also known as the sun of the morning. After the ceremonies in the grove, there was given in the dining room of Beverly Hall at midnight a feast of the gods at which neither meat nor spices formed part of the menu, but only fruits, nuts, and other products of sun-kissed foods. And that should tell you something about sun-kissed oranges. <laughs> The conclusion of the rites was held at sunrise in the grove with a musical communion service at which nectar of roses distilled from the 30,000 roses blooming each June upon the lawns at Beverly Hall was served as emblematic of the wine of the soul, and for this service the rose bushes were planted several years ago. This is also from the book, folks. I wish that all the readers of this book might have been present at the preparation, at the building, and at the dedication of this ancient magic circle. Or I wish that I might be able to give a detailed description of these sublime ceremonies in this book. However, I cannot do this here, though I hope that in some future work I will be able to do so. Sufficient be it to say that when the stone made out of cement by one of the brothers was nearly finished, the dedication took place, and the emblems placed in the stone itself before it was completed were the American beauty rose in full bloom. This as a representation or symbol of the soul that has reached full illumination. The mystic ring this was a solid gold ring belonging to one of the members present, upon which had been engraved the cross and the pentagram. All members of the Magi will know what this symbol stands for. The ring itself, as is known to the Magi, is a protecting agent against all evil or malignant influences when worn during any ceremonial or developing work. And the true magic mirror... This is an emblem of the soul, which when fully developed will act as a mirror to the universe, wherein may be wisdom and truth. Lastly, a complete copy of the private textbook entitled, quote, Ritualistic Occultism, unquote, which contains the ceremonies as made use of by the Magi. And four of these ceremonials were made use of by four of the Magi in the dedication of the Magic Circle. When all of this had taken place, the stone was completed, and then later in the day the characters were engraved upon the stone by the brother who had completed the stone. Of the midnight feast to the gods, and of the morning services which took place in the grove, it is not lawful for me to speak at this time. But it is my sincere prayer that all who are enrolled in the sacred schools may some day be present with us and witness these sublime ceremonies, especially as they are conferred in the spring of the year. In the spring of the year. Arrangements were made by the delegates present through voluntary contributions to either buy another large grove, or if that is found impracticable, to build a much larger hall in the Grove of Osiris so that advanced ceremonies may be held the coming spring at the 69th Convocation of the Rose Cross Order. Now I'm going to reveal something to you that I have never told you before on this program. I've been working up to it, and now is the time to tell you before I read from the next section of this book. For then you will understand what has been happening in the last 50 years and what is happening now. It was Harry Truman, a 33rd degree Freemason, who signed the United Nations Treaty, who pushed through and signed the United Nations Participation Act. It was also Harry Truman, a 33rd degree Freemason, operating in concert with Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS, a member of the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta and of the Order of the Knights Templar, who created the National Security Act, pushed it through Congress, 
Harry Truman signed it. It created the umbrella of national security, a curtain of secrecy. It created the Central Intelligence Agency. And behind this curtain of secrecy, the secret societies have been working to destroy the sovereignty of all nations and bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government. And folks, all of the bugaboo enemies that you've been afraid of all your life were never enemies at all. For these were deceptions, manipulations. The only enemy, folks, that the people of the world have ever had is right here. Right here in this country, down at the corner in your town, in the temple that has no windows. And now, reading again from the book, the report from the 68th Convocation of the Order of the Rose Cross. Introduction to the Great Seal. It is rather a strange and an unknown thing for one to write an introduction to a single chapter appearing in a book, but the conditions are so unusual as to warrant it. More than a year ago, Grace K. Morey, the author of the article, The Great Seal of the United States and Its Mystic Significance, prepared a sketch for a short primer of the Illuminati teachings. And in this sketch, as will be shown by the drawings, it was brought out that man is not only a threefold being, but that he is actually a fourfold being as well. In short, that when he has succeeded in reaching soul illumination, he is the completed pyramid or true triangle. If the student will give serious study to the article on the seal of the United States, he will find that on the reverse side of the seal, which is as yet uncut, there is to be found the pyramid, but with the capstone as yet not placed, and thus he will see that the philosophy of the Illuminati is the absolute and undeniable philosophy upon which these United States are founded, as is clearly indicated by our fourfold philosophy, by the drawings representing our philosophy, and by the drawings of the reverse side of the United States seal. And thus it would appear that the unseen hierarchies which shaped the foundation of the great republic which must some day rule the world are the same hierarchies which gave us the soul science philosophy as taught by the Illuminati. And now you know why what has happened in this country has happened and you now know why what is happening today is happening and you now know why on the reverse of the great seal of the United States are the words Novus Ordo Cyclorum, which literally translated means the new order of the ages, also known, ladies and gentlemen, as the new world order. But I won't let you rest with that shock. Listen to this, dear listeners. Hold on to your chairs, because the incredible admission that is coming to you right out of the pages of this book is going to knock you flat. Reading again from the book. And thus, it would appear that the unseen hierarchies which shape the foundation of the great republic which must someday rule the world are the same hierarchies which gave us the soul science philosophy as taught by the Illuminati. And now let us look into the future, not far, but just beyond the line. We find that scholars condemn the design of the reverse side of the United States seal, that it has never been cut, but has remained hidden as though it were something to be ashamed of. However, though this appears the truth, it is not the truth. The reason why it has never been cut is because the time is not yet, as the capstone has not yet been set. And what is this capstone? My reader, prepare for a shock. When Atlantis ruled the word, that which is now America was connected with Egypt by what is now Mexico, and in Mexico, in the territory of Yucatan, there is a pyramid in which the fire philosophers worshipped God as divine fire and life in like manner as did the initiates of Egypt, for the two were then one. America is not complete, 
and will not be complete, cannot be complete, until Mexico is again part of America as she was in the long ago. And when Mexico is once again a part of the United States, then will the capstone have been set on the pyramid and the reverse side of the United States seal will be cut. Thus you will see that the soul science primer with its drawings is but the beginning of the article concerning the seal of the United States, while the article on body, mind, spirit, and soul is the final thereof. May it not be long until the Holy Pyramid shall be completed, and may it be completed without the shedding of blood. Lovingly given, R. Swineberg Clymer, Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, July 6, 1916. And now you know the final truth, ladies and gentlemen. Now you know the purpose of the free trade agreements. Now you know the purpose of GATT and NAFTA. Now you know where we're headed. Now you know that the middle class in this country is doomed. Now you know that the New World Order is being brought about by the intelligence community and the secret societies whose headquarters are in the United States of America, just 13 blocks from the White House. Now you know in the incredible admissions in their own writing in this book published by the ancient order of the rose and cross. Now you know that the Illuminati is real, that Freemasonry is a part of the Illuminati, that the rose and cross is a part of the Illuminati, that they are also called the order, the brotherhood, that they also consist of the Knights Templars, they also consist of the Knights of Malta and all of the other secret societies whose organizational structure is in the shape of a pyramid with a few at the top who really know what the great work and the great plan is, and a whole bunch of slathering idiots thirsting after the secrets on the bottom who will never, ever know anything. Are the cockroaches scattering? If this broadcast doesn't do it, nothing will. If this doesn't wake you up, ladies and gentlemen, nothing will. If you don't understand now the 18 hours of the series that I've aired on the Mystery Schools, you will never understand it now or in the future. If you don't know where we're headed now, then you never will. If you are not concerned now, then you have already placed the chains upon your ankles and you have already watched freedom fly. If this broadcast does not do it, nothing will. This is the last voice of freedom. This is the only revelatory media source in the world today. The hour of the time is the only outlet for truth left upon this earth. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have heard tonight is the final parting of the curtain. It is the opening of the last door that was to be opened. It is the final understanding of where we have been, where we are at, and where we are going. It is the light. It is the illumination in the darkest corners. You are looking at the forbidden fruit. You have heard tonight what you were never to hear, what has been forbidden for thousands of years. You now know what the great work is. You now know who is bringing it about. You too can find this book if you search hard enough in the incredible admissions that are contained within it. will give you the ammunition and the armor to march out here on the battlefield with me and many others who are trying to stop what is coming. Remember what Mr. Swineburne said at the end of his article. And I'll read that to you again. May it not be long until the Holy Pyramid shall be completed 
and may it be completed without the shedding of blood. Lovingly given, R. Swineburn Climber, Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, July 6th, 1916. And I am telling you now, their goal is to destroy all other religions, save theirs. Destroy all existing nation-states, save theirs. And shackle the mob. And that is you. Good night, dear listeners. And God bless you all.